Good morning. Good morning. It's not up. Good morning. Oh, it's not hot. So we will start uh, the agenda. The next item on the agenda is item 15, call to order and roll call to establish quorum. I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so that a roll call vote can be established for quorum. Member Bradford. Here. Member Bradford is present. Uh, Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Here. Member Holder is present. Mem Member Jones Sawyer. Present. Member Jones Sawyer is present. Member Lewis. Present. Member Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. Excuse me. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task force. It takes five to establish a quorum. There are nine members present. A quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. I will now turn to uh, Ms. Aisha Martin-Walton for public comment. We'll start with the phone lines, uh, and then we have a list of folks from yesterday uh, for in-person public comment. Um, and if we have time remaining, we'll take some more um, in-person public comment. So Ms. Martin-Walton. Sure, good morning. Chair Moore, are we uh, two minutes today as similar to yesterday? Yes. yes? Yeah. All right. Good morning, Two everyone. Minutes. My name is Aisha Martin-Walton. I'm with the Department of Justice, and the task force would like to hear from each of you. The public comment period will be for approximately one hour, and each person will have two minutes. Please be advised that in fairness to everyone, at the two-minute mark, you may be politely interrupted. However, please know that there is a public comment period during each meeting, and the task force highly encourages you to participate. Also, you may submit your written comments at any time via email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. And we have a list of in-person folks. Uh, we will call you your names after we are done with the uh, phone uh, call-in commenters. So with that, we will start the um, call-in. So Leah, good morning. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a comment from the phone lines, you may press 1, then 0 on your telephone keypad. All right. Can we have the first uh, commenter, please? It'll just take one moment, please. All right. Thank you. Starting at 9.15. All right, and we go to line number 16. One moment here. <coughs> and line 16, you may go ahead. Yes, good morning. This is... And line 16, you may go ahead. Good morning. This is Angela... Good morning. This is... Oh. Angela, I need you to... Er, line 16, I need you to mute your other device that you are on. Angela, I need you to... Er, Line 16, I need you to mute your other device that you are on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. I hope that's better. This is Angela Nirvana. I've been in my feelings since two members on the task force said that there's been racist remarks at these hearings. I've been at every last one of them. I've never heard anyone say anything racist. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful to define what being racist is. And to give an example or two, since calling Friedman racist is catching all over the nation, racism is having killed for and stolen Friedman repair to amass power with the Friedman vote to make us bottom caste, while whites, who are immigrants too, none of you are native to this land, eat from the wealth our ancestors generated with their lives, and then legislate Friedman oppression with your war on drugs and poverty. Racism is making California a sanctuary state and giving illegals the right to vote, work, obtain driver license, and be granted protection from deportation while Friedman suffer the highest rates of unemployment, underemployment, homelessness, and incarceration. In 2020, 
Cal Matters stated black renters have been disproportionately forced out of cities as cost evictions climb. The black population has plunged 45 percent in Compton, 43 percent in San Francisco and 40 percent in Oakland. Racism is uh, are the ethnogenocidal plans of our government at every branch to erase and replace us with immigrants with our own vote before making us American and then picking and choosing which ones of us should benefit from reparations when the majority of us are living the vestiges of every harm as outlined in that 500 page prelim report. American freedmen in closing uh, can be prejudiced, but we can never be racist. We don't have the money nor the power to oppress anyone. We are on life support right now, losing ground daily. And I'm not a racist for calling out immigrants, uh, immigration as the American freedmen albatross that it is. Just look at the data. If you wouldn't dare to fix your mouth to call the late great Senator Barbara Jordan a racist, then don't call the most oppressed group in California racist. That's the very definition of elitist. Thank you for allowing me to share. I'll land there. Thank you. Next next speaker, please. Leah, next line. Next next is line 13. Good morning. My name is Christina Griffin Jones. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with the California Black Power Network. For Black people unable to trace their lineage due to the various issues uplifted by community, issues like adoption history, accessible access to resources, houselessness, or because they descend from a black immigrant should still be entitled to full or partial compensation based on meeting a number of criteria. A starting point for this criteria is outlined in the very comprehensive memo submitted by the California Black Power Network created in partnership with black led and black serving community organizations across the state. This criteria would ensure those incarcerated during the war on drugs, those impacted by segregated schools and other harms outlined by the task force are eligible to receive compensation for those harms. Many of the proposed timelines for the five categories of harm extend to the present. We recommend a residency requirement that is not tied to a specific historical event or a particular cutoff date in the past to ensure that all black people in California within a proposed timeline are eligible for, eligible for reparations. I thank you. Thank you very much. Leah, next line. Next line number is 33, go ahead. Uh, hi, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Uh, this is John Mudd. Um, I, I called yesterday um, and, you know, I watched the, the, the meeting and I seen you. I seen you all high off the hopium because they, they rolled out this little commercial. But I'm not satisfied because I talk to people every day about reparations and I bring up this, this task force and no one knows about it. But you know who is promoting this? Fox News and Daily Mail. And I know y'all heard them. You heard the naysayers from other communities call up and talk trash about this whole thing. And, and I don't even know what to say at this point. Um, you've given them all the ammunition they need to tear this down with this whole fiasco with the Bunch Center. You heard them talking about, oh, they're just going to mismanage the money. Well, you've already given them, like, everything. And where do you think we're going to go from here? If we weather the storm and we actually get through this and they, they push this through, if you set up this situation where it's just going to be an, uh, an institution that's doing oversight over all these little nonprofits, if we have another scandal, do you know how much damage you're going to do to the reparations cause? Like, like, I hope Narkin and Cobra are happy because you idiots are, are, are causing nothing but problems for us. You need to get out of this fight. You need to find something else to do. Go, to, go, go on vacation to the Caribbean, go to Africa, you know, do your little pan-African nonsense, but stay out of politics because all you all do is mess things up. You don't have enough sense to understand what you're doing. But, you know, look, again, uh, we need a full service uh, for Ms. Burrow. Uh, we, need, we need something that if, if something goes wrong 
Excuse me, sir. Thank you so much for your comments this morning. I'm so sorry to have to cut you off, um, but thank you. Leah, next caller, please. Thank you. The next caller is line 12. You may go ahead. Yes, thank you, Leah. Uh, my name is Katrina Hassan Hamilton. I'm a native Californian. I grew up in Inglewood. I currently reside in San Diego, and I'm sitting here with my 10-year-old daughter. Hi, I am Rakaia Abyssinia Well, um, I'm Miss Katrina's daughter, and I'm in fifth grade, and my favorite color is baby blue. And her favorite color is baby blue. She's in the fifth grade. It's important for us to be here because as an educator, as someone who grew up in California, I've never been anywhere else. I really want to thank this task force. I know you've heard a lot of things. I want to give a special greeting to Dr. Shirley Weber, Dr. Akila Weber, and of course, Council President Pro Tem Monica Montgomery Stepp, Dr. Amos Brown for your advocacy, Senator Stephen Bradford, and Chair Attorney Camilla Moore. No matter what you hear, this is a huge undertaking, and we are very proud of you. So my mother came from Chicago to California in 1959. And it's important for us to make sure that we include the history of African American Muslims. I have not heard the history of African American Muslims on this, um, this whole reparations task force. And I want to make sure that we're included because we have a history that goes from policing in the 60s all the way up into burning of our businesses on, in Los Angeles on Central and in Broadway in 92 by people say it's from people in the neighborhood, but it was others who came in and I'm living testimony to that. But in my 12 page document that I will be emailing to you, I do want to ask you when you state in your executive summary about providing funding for African-American schools, that we also include land and funding for private owned black peace K through 12 schools like Isla Academy that thriving in Los Angeles and ill mode that's thriving in Oakland. Thank we you know so much. I'm so sorry to have thank to uh, end you in the middle of your sentence, oh, but thank you for that, that helpful testimony this morning. Thank you. Leah, next caller, please. That is line 35. You may go ahead. Good morning. Good morning again. Um, nice to be here today. My name is Ivy Jean. I am president of Africa. That's spelled A-F-F-R-E-E-C-A. And it stands for American Freedom Fighters Resource, Educational Excursions and Community Advocacy. Our website is F-R-E-E-A-F-F-R-E-E-C-A.com. As you know, from the last conference in San Diego, we advocate for reparations in the form of free travel and free education two things that were prohibited from us during the institution of slavery in America. Our goal is to empower African-Americans through travel and create pipelines into industries such as aviation and STEM programs um, other than industry, uh, other than the traditional industries that we tend to go for like entertainment and sports. Africa is a nonprofit organization uh, registered as a 50 one C three through um, the IRS, and we hope to gain donations from government entities, corporations, poly um, philanthropic philanthropic or organizations. Uh, we do not want our donations to come from the people that we are trying to help. That would be like asking the homeless to pay rent. Um, I hope that you will consider our programs during going forward during your deliberation. Once again, our website is freeafreeca.com. We hope to partner with all organizations who support our initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Leah, next line, please. That is 21. You may go ahead. Yes, my name is Mark Havis Johnson, business owner of Keppel Rock Books, Fly America Aboriginal Civil Society. I want to ex pose the question, what if we are successful? Um, propaganda and distortion of war has always been used for ignoring the disparities of black Americans. And I have a clear case of eminent domain where people say they can't figure it out. Well, I was in a program, I was from Memphis, I moved to LA six years ago in the ODR. And when I completed it and was medically cleared, I had an apartment in Glendale. And in Glendale, I started this bookstore and I got a letter 
from the U.S. Info at the main authority, and they came to try to take over my property. I filed a WAB form in Chapter 4 proceeding for a homestead, and they sent the legal immigrants like they said they would do in Query 14, and they attacked me. They violated the fair housing rights, and the, and the police said they could do nothing. So I became a vigilante, and I was stripped and threw in L.A. County for months after I had been medically cleared, which shows a uh, medical bias, in the healthcare industry, they should have sold. I was clear, but I got out. I started another business and applied for hundreds of thousand dollar loans. But they was complaining about my student loans, my military service. Though it was over with, and though grant system is very complicated. You say you want to learn about lineage, the Treaty of Paris that you talk about with the Aboriginals, Title Eight Fourteen, uh, Title Eight Fourteen O One USC Code. You know, and I propose these grants for Christ Center Ministries out here in LA or in South Central for the social economic disadvantaged individuals to go from welfare system to entrepreneurship. And it said they're cooning for Zaddy and they being Uncle Tom. So, you know, I did emergency to help y'all promote with Charles Hamilton, but he was in the emergency industry after he made New York raining. And they told him that if he didn't worship the devil and, and, and do what the LGBT and M2 told him, me too told him that he will get sanctioned. So I'm staying down like four flats on the Denver Rizzoti yet. You know what I'm saying? Stop singing and stop swinging at the hypocrisy of democracy. Culture is science. Sir, you know, we're not you, left with the Thank you so much for your comments this morning. Sorry to have to cut you off, but again, thanks for calling in. Leah, next line, please. Next line is 29. You may go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go Hello? ahead. Okay. Good morning, Task Force. My name is Kristen Nemers. I'm calling on behalf of the California Black Power Network. We submitted a proposal to you all yesterday via email, but I wanted to call and uplift that proposal for an eligibility structure that gives special consideration to descendants of people enslaved in America, but is also inclusive of all Black people who experience harm within the five categories and timelines established by the task force. Our proposal advocates that for non-cash-related reparations, meaning programs, investments, and resources, all Black people who have identified as Black for a significant period before their establishment should be eligible. All Black people living in Black communities are similarly impacted by the lack of resources, investments, health inequities, et cetera, and policy changes that would help restore those communities, such as resources for youth development, free health care programs, increased SNAP funding for poor Black families should be available to all Black people that are presently impacted. This is in, align with the, in alignment with the UN standards, specifically a guarantee of non-repetition. To exclude some Black people from reparations programs like these is to continue the ongoing harm to our communities. Our proposal also advocates that for cash payments, special consideration be given to descendants of people enslaved in the U.S. by making lineage a separate and single tier in criteria. If met, it should entitle that individual to full compensation. However, if someone is unable to trace their lineage for a range of reasons listed by the community, but they, are, but they were here during the specific timelines of harm determined by the task force, there should be an alternative criteria connected to those harms suffered by that person. For example, one of the categories for compensation is disproportionate mass incarceration and over-policing. The proposed timeline for that harm is 1970 to the present. If a black person can show that they were incarcerated during the failed war on drugs, they are part of the group that was harmed and they should be entitled to full or partial compensation depending on how much harm they have suffered within these categories. Another category is housing discrimination. In our structure, someone can show that they are part of a historically marginalized group that experienced redlining and housing discrimination within the timeline you all have talked about, 1937 to 1977. They should also partially or fully be eligible for compensation because they too are part of the group that has been harmed. This type of thank you, provides thank you so much for your comments this morning. Thanks for calling in. Sorry to have to uh, cut you off in the middle of your sentence. Leah, next line, please. Thank you. Next line is 16. Please go ahead. Greetings to the esteemed California Task Force. I am Naheem Wei, president and co-founder of the United Sons and Daughters of Freedom. Yesterday marked the day in 1865 that the federal government created the Freedmen's Bureau and the Freedmen's Bank. And so it is apropos that today we recommend the same for California. The purpose of establishing the Freedmen's Bureau for newly emancipated persons was to protect the formerly enslaved from the badges, incidents, and consequences of slavery. Making the case for establishing the Freedmen's Bureau, Charles Sumner, former Massachusetts Senator, citing the Commission of Freedmen, later called the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission in his report, quoted, quote, we need a Freedmen's Bureau not because these people are Negroes, 
but because they are men who have been for generations in the sport of their right. Sumner also laid out the intent of the proposed bureau and what he called main features. Quote, it provides exclusively for freedmen, meaning thereby such persons as were once slaves, without undertaking to embrace persons generally of African descent. End quote. Sumner was clear on who such an agency should be created for. California has echoed that sentiment in its vote to distribute reparations based on one's lineage as opposed to a broad and equally ambiguous race standard. Unfortunately, Reconstruction was overturned and every promise to the freedmen broken, hampering upward social and economic mobility. It is only fitting that California establishes an Office of Freedmen Affairs to govern and regulate the lawful measures created by this august body. Peace, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Leah, next caller. Next caller is line 36. You may go ahead. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Billy Gambella. I'm from the Bronx, New York. I'm a writer and researcher of genealogy and genetics. I've been doing this over 15 years. And uh, first, I would like to say um, the task force, I think you're doing a phenomenal job. I don't know what the key to success is, but the key to failure is trying to please everyone. And uh, with that being said, um, how can we repair or give reparations without repairing the loss of identity and nationality of African Americans? which are some of the few people in the world who have this dilemma. And according to the U.S. Office of Management and Budget of Racial Classification, every race class has the origin and original people of their continent or country, except African-Americans and Afro-Latinos. And of course, to be Latino, you can be one regardless of race. So if we don't have origins in a continent nor a nation, it leaves us nationless, and it also leaves us in a non-indigenous status. So understand scientifically and genetically, if you are of African origin, you are indigenous from somewhere. I have developed a comprehensive research plan to uncover ancestral origin lineages using five methods, genealogy for the paper trail, or those domo mixture DNA, mtDNA full genome sequence, Y chromosome 67 to 1100 marker test, and also clinical grade whole genome sequence tests for ancestry, health, wellness, and nutrition. I have compiled 13 genetic studies from peer-reviewed geneticists about the genetic expansions of Africa and Africans outside of Africa 15 to 20,000 years before present in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. For example, there's a 2015 study from Harvard University entitled Genetic Evidence for the Two Founded Populations of the America, which lists ancient remains of Melanesian Austronesian people as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. So let me say this in closing. When I say DNA tests, I'm talking about clinical grade whole genome sequence tests and mtDNA full genome sequence tests, not Sir, a DTC direct to consumer. Thank over you the so much DNA for your test. comments. I'm sorry Thanks. to cut you off. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. Leah, next caller. Next is line 32. Please go ahead. Line 32, you are open. You may go ahead. Please unmute your phone. Hello? That, go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Muhajir Boyle Hassan. I'm a native of Oakland, California. Greetings to my foundational Black American family, native Black American family, and freedmen's. In addition to our cash reparations, which is an aspect and factor in our plight as Native Black Americans, which is not even up for debate, included in our reparations package, amongst protective laws specific to Black Americans, ought to be clauses where we're equally protected under Second and Fourth Amendment law that already exist, with no undermining our right and our own self-defense of our own lives, protecting and protecting our loved ones, households, lives, protecting our loved ones, households, and our properties without any double standards in contrast to non-Black citizens. And I'll end my plan there. Thank, Thank you. you. Leah? Next, we go to line 15. Please go ahead.
Line 15, you may go ahead. Do you have your phone muted? Line 15. We'll come back to that line. We'll move on to the next one for right now. We'll go to 44. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Great. Hi. Uh, I, I have some uncomfortable questions. I apologize. Um, but I think these should be taken into consideration. First of all, I, I want to make sure that I go on record as being very aware of the uh, inequalities that blacks have suffered throughout and redress needs to be made. However, given that, these questions I think should be addressed. The first one is, who would be eligible? Would somebody who is half black, one eighth black, one sixteenth black, would they be eligible for this? How about somebody that emigrated from Jamaica and is black and has suffered all the injustices of black but has no ancestry in, in slavery? The next question I have, and the biggest my concern is, the idea of cash payments. Uh, I'm all for social adjustments, everything to make blacks have a better than equal chance with affirmative action, uh, housing, preschool, all that stuff. But to, to send a check to everybody that has black ancestry just doesn't feel right at all. Would Oprah get a check? Would Clarence Thomas get a check? Would somebody, and, and then once all these checks were dispensed, how about somebody that was born two years later and is black, but sorry, that pool of money has already been spent to everybody that was alive before you. So I, I know you have a, a Herculean task trying to figure out all this out, but I hope you include those serious issues. The final one, the one that worries me the most is white backlash to something like this. The, uh, or, or Asian black lash. Uh, how about Indians? Indians would say, wait a minute, we were, we were, we were mistreated worse than black people. We, there was genocide against Indians. Shouldn't we be getting this? Sir, thank uh, it, you. The, the, uh, <laughs> your, time, your time is up. Thank you so much. Thanks for your comments. Thank Leah, you. next caller, please. You bet. Next caller is 20. You may go ahead. Good morning, Task Force. My name is Theo Sedell. I'm a fourth generation Californian, born and raised in Los Angeles. I would like to thank the chairperson Moore, Vice Chair Brown, members of the task force, members of the DOJ staff for all the work you have done in this process. I'm calling in today to talk about the communication. There's a lot of information that is not being discussed in the communication, and I think it's a lack of transparency. I think the DOJ staff really needs to address the public and act in discussing the restrictions that are involved with the communication firms that things need to be discussed further. Second, I would like to thank the task force for the lineage based standards that they have taken. Uh, that's the last thing that I have. Thank you for all the, all the hard work you have done. Also, when choosing a location, I think Los Angeles is a good location as we had the best turnout. Thank you. Thank you. Leah, next line, please. That is line 24. You may go ahead. Hello, this is Creed uh, Harrington. I'm calling in to employ the council, the, um, the council to essentially vote for a agency, not oversight, an agency that will do the work and, and be there, an agency that essentially will be a sophisticated 21st century version of the Freedmen's Bureau that will be there to essentially do the work of repair and uh, administer the justice claim for those who are descendants of U.S. chattel slavery, those who are descendants of freedmen, lineage-based. Uh, it is important that we understand that this great work and this great task is going to employ more than just having an oversight committee and, and charging organizations that essentially are already underfunded, that have political views that are outside the boundaries of what it takes 
to serve that particular people, those people who endured a 435-year genocidal economic and political holocaust in this country, in this land, and before it was a country, all the way up until present day. It is important that we understand this, and it is dangerous. And what we're doing is we're entertaining a dangerous endeavor if we do not support a agency that will do this work and that will be held accountable. It is very important for us to have an agency that we can hold the people accountable for this great work, to trivialize our justice claim in such a great endeavor, and to charge that to just organizations that are underfunded, we don't, under, we don't understand how they're going to be able to create uh, streamline uh, entities that will be able to work in agencies that will be able to work with each other if they're not for profits. How do they do that? How do they live up to that task? With an agency, we can employ experts and people who are Sir, trained. Thank in you so much for your comments we this morning. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Leah, we have time for two more callers. So, our next to last caller, please open the line. Certainly, that will go to line 14. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm continuing my statement from yesterday. As Black Americans, I would suggest persons not of the lineage did not take public speaking spaces from black Americans. I know there's a lot of misrepresentation of black Americans in these meetings. So if you have any respect at all for black American culture, I kindly ask you to step aside as Brother Carrier says, but I cannot stop you. I notice a lot of people don't get to uh, speak while waiting in line. We are mostly common working people that take off from their jobs to be here taking trains, planes, and automobiles. And it's also due to eligibility requirements. We need to make sure the proper people are getting repaired, and that is Black Americans that descend from U.S. chattel slavery and that can trace their lineage past the 1865 census. And also, persons have to identify as Black 20 years or more because we see what affirmative action and civil rights laws have done in the past and it's open up to all minorities and have not aided Black Americans yet. And I would like to add another disparity to study and develop for reparations, and that is the cost play, the cost plan of Black Americans for benefits like scholarships, media, all kind of things that uh, is detrimental, politics, everything. We didn't know that Stephen Fetcher was Jamaican and Bohemian. We just thought he was an off cold Black man. We did not know our grandparents and the generation with them did not approve of Sidney Portier's Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and he's not of the lineage. Even today, a lot of persons uh, not of the lineage are profiting from Black American life, whether in media, like trauma films, or in politics that are making detrimental decisions for my culture. It also, we need to reflect that it's not just white supremacy, but anti-Black American hate Thank you. All. Thank you so much um, for your call this morning. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to call in. Uh, Leah, our next speaker. Thank, thank you. Leah, our next caller, please. Next, we go to line 11. Please go ahead. Yes, reparations for California. I feel that if you are born in California, you should get your reparations for California. And those people who are not born in California should wait for their state to pay reparations for them in order to receive it. And they should use their birth certificate to prove where they're from, to show what state they are from using residency of their mother. It will tell you city, towns, and street addresses and places of birth of your mother. And we don't want people double dipping into reparations, say that if they take the residencies of California and pay all those people who are residents and then turn around those people leave their state and go to another state and uh, use whatever uh, identification they need and pay for reparation again. So we don't want any people out there trying to double dip and uh, get reparation. And as I said before, we should use uh, only those people who are born in California to pay reparations and those who are just residency should, again, wait for their state to pay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Because the last caller did not 
use all of his time. We have time for one more caller. Please, Leah, the, our last line, please. Is line 42. You may go ahead. Line 42, you may go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Randy Bell. Um, my family's been in Sacramento since 1932. And I um, apologize I haven't been able to follow all of your um, meetings, but I thought it important to call in this morning and uh, express a um, uh, brief comment. I conducted extensive research into how my land was taken under the color of law, enforced by systematic implementation and institutionalized processes. Um, in short, if we inherit land and are denied a job, denied access to loans from banks, and are, are, and are unable to generate enough money to pay taxes, then the property is eventually lost. In short, um, I think it's important that I share some of my research um, with the committee and which I'll forward to you. It's, I conducted it over a period of about 10 years. i um, got um, extensive uh, land, um, um, property um, documents and maps that shows how um, uh, the system was enforced and is um, appropriate, I think, that this committee um, uh, incorporate this information that I'm going to send to you to enable it to um, adequately uh, support the $5 million um, restitution that's been um, proposed. And I look forward to uh, communicating with you later in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. That concludes our, in, uh, our callers calling in. Feel free if you had, did not get, have an opportunity to speak today. Um, you can always submit your comments in writing to reparations task force at dlj.ca.gov or feel free to call in at our next meeting. Uh, as we switch to in person calls, uh, Chair Moore, I'm not sure if you wanted to um, share any words. However, we do have a list of people who signed up yesterday, and I will call your names in order of your signing that list yesterday. Shall I proceed? All right, okay, first we have, I'll call the first 10, Alim Shabazz, well, I'll call them all. Alim Shabazz, Elizabeth Jackson, Fanny Barnes, Fiona Johnson, then uh, Emmanuel Smith, Muhar Bul, Bul Hassan, Roy Lee, then Jonathan Booker, and then Josiah Williams, Lamont Collins, Tierra Ryder, Tony Tinker Loken, Friday Jones, Thomas Williams, Thea Austin, Alexander Brannon, Karen Bunny, Gail Wilkerson, Matthew Burgess, Tanya Burgess, Jonathan Burgess, Manon Johnson, and Michael Johnson. So if you could please line up in that order. We would appreciate it. And our first presenter, please approach the mic, and each person will have two minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Bishop. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. You all know who I am. And y'all know about my missing granddaughter, um, Shanika Giggs, I'm Shanika Williams, okay? And y'all know about me from slavery, okay? Now, I'm, we go in front of the Port of Oakland for land, thanks to that young man speaking on land yesterday. We go in front of the Port of Oakland for land and property, okay, on March the 9th. 
anyone want to come down to support us getting land and property in Oakland, they're welcome to do that. We're going from the board at uh, be about 4 or 4.30 at the Port of Oakland and Oakland, okay? And I'm also preparing to, to pile a lot of land from the port and the railroad company there in Oakland because all of Oakland was a slave plantation. All of it, okay, the port and the city. And it was run by the railroad companies, not the city, the state, but the port of Oakland run by the railroad companies for 40 years, from 1852 to 1892. We won't change that and receive our money, gold, and land from the port. And I'm also prepared to file for reparation for all the blacks in America and do it the right way. Okay, I'm prepared to do that because I've been in this for 50 years. I have material, a lot of material for everything, for all of it. I've done the research and the studies on it, okay? And uh, I might not file from an American court. I might take it from the world's court when I file, okay? But I want y'all, if you're gonna do this, do it the right, do it the right way, okay? And Mr. Amon Brown, from what I see here, it's a conflict of interest what you're doing. You here with the state and everything sitting on the state panel and everything, and also uh, the, uh, then you're trying to get reparation in San Francisco. So, you know, the state and everything, they're paying it for the whole state if they pay it, you know? So it's a conflict of interest what you're doing. So don't mess around and go to jail, okay? All right? Because I'm a, a powerful attorney general for the state of California. If the governor don't pull you out of there, I can. Okay, next, next speaker should be Aleem Shabazz. Good morning, committee. My name is Aleem Shabazz. I'm from Compton, California, and Gardena. Beg your pardon? Uh, yes, my name is Aleem Shabazz, and I'm from Compton and Gardena. Uh, Senator Bradford, you have been doing a tremendous job, um, which you have done with uh, the college getting paid is phenomenal. They should, uh, they should also know that Governor Newsom signed it, but you did all the legwork, and I want to commend you. Um, I have an organization called the Northeast Health Resource Center. It's a community development corporation, and my primary purpose is to get these young people working. Uh, one of the things that they have changed is what, what we call, when I was going to school, was uh, programs that were electives, electrician, carpenters. We don't have that now. We need it. We need it to get reinstituted and back, back into the system. Because if these youth uh, do not uh, have jobs, what else are they gonna do? The other thing is that when they're busy, they're occupied, then we don't have to worry about them. They have self-confidence, they're happy, and they're working and providing a working wage. Now they changed the term, what is called now CTE, Career Technical Education. All it is is a trades. So we need to go back to what was working. When I was high school, I had elective, I had painting, I had carpentry, and now um, I formed a nonprofit, CDC, Community Development Corporation, so that we can institute. The, uh, one of the, the greatest thing that Reverend Su Leon Sullivan had was uh, <coughs> the Workforce Development Program, where he had 400 pastors, started with 400 pastors. Sir, I'm so sorry to state. interrupt okay. you, but, well, but thank you so much for right, coming out you. today. Thank you. All right, next speaker should be Elizabeth Jackson. Oh yeah, Ms. Jackson isn't here today. Fanny Barnes. Thank you, good morning. Good morning. My name is Fanny Barnes and uh, I'm from West Point, Georgia, but I've lived in California since 1969, and I, I'm happy to see uh, 
the work that you're doing, which is great. And I feel that being an African American, that all black people from Africa should be paid with this reparation. We were not asked to be brought over here. Our ancestors were stolen and brought to this country and treated inhumane from the very beginning. And we are still being treated that way. Amen. The beginning of this year in January, a young brother in Tennessee was killed. By who? The police officers that's supposed to be protecting us. We have no protection in this country. We never have had any protection in this country. We have to protect ourselves. Yes. And we need to come together as a people. Yes, ma'am. Okay? Amen. We can stop all this stuff. Yes, okay? But we got to unite. Okay? Right, right. And not just black people, but all people of color, because all people of color are oppressed in this country. And we don't need them. We raised them. We built this. Allow, excuse me, allow her to give her public comment, please. The things that are happening to us to go on and on, decade after decade. And if you have a problem with paying us, this is how you should pay us. You should pay us with land because the land belonged to us, okay? And if you think you can't pay us with cash, okay, we lived in this country for over 400 years. We worked free. Thank you okay? so much, ma'am. I'm no so sorry to cut, cut you off in the okay. middle of your sentence, but thank pay you so us. much. Okay, thank you very much. We need thank thank you very much for for coming out today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, our next uh, our next speaker should be um, should be Fiani Johnson, and remember to speak into your in the mic if you want your words recorded. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here today. I am Fiani Johnson. I'm from East Palo Alto, California. Um, reparations for EPA. However, I'm here representing Boss Bay Area of Oakland, California. My employer, we are the Social Justice Collective, and we fight to change underlying causes of systemic racism, um, inequality, we uh, racially biased policies. And for 49 years, Boss has been working to um, uh, house the houseless and um, heal families who's been impacted by trauma and violence or whatever. The 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 violence that we experience and they support through mental health and uh, offer reentry re and rehabilitation services and employment and education, right? So we come here to uplift the task force in the work and propose that, that repair for our children who's dying in the communities and the mass incarceration of our mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. Uh, I think that we should uh, be receiving land, cash, economic equality, resources. We need agency. We need resp restoration of hope in our communities. Uh, we need to dismantle the oppressive practices of the people that we share these communities with, i.e. modern day slavery. Mass incarceration is still a form of slavery. So I come to you as a descendant of chattel slaves to say California is supposed to be a sanctuary state and it has never been one for us. So therefore, please, please, um, we just want we just want this to be a part of the repair and we're proposing that. And I want to just uplift Miss Camila Moore. Thank you for showing up and you're being targeted because you're on point, sis, and we here, we support you, sis. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker should be Emmanuel Smith. To the honest uh, members of the council, distinguished members of the council, especially Camilla Moore, um, Yasmin, and Fiani, uh, I come to you by the grace of God in the spirit of St. Betty, the first black woman doctor at Stanford and a cure of cancer. Cancer is not a death sentence. We bought our 40 acres in an ATV, and the state still seeks to steal it. But what they meant for evil, God meant for good. 
I ran for governor, and the whole Bay came together to save my life. And so I'm asking the citizens for the job of being the first black governor of the so-called liberal state of California. Lineage is legacy. It's time to separate the wheat from the chaff. As task force members, you know the law. If I put my hands on my head like this and say am I being arrested or detained, I have now completed my compact with the police. It's the officer's duty after that to complete their compact with mine. This will be the, this will be the biggest case since Dred Scott. Am I a citizen or can I be maimed, falsely accused, or falsely imprisoned for running out of gas? As California has acknowledged my lineage, they have also acknowledged that the descendant community is my peer group and thus my jury. I have full belief in that, belief in that community. Mama Gail told me I have a dream. I looked at Sister Tiambe and told him, I already lived the dream. Now it's time for your children and grandchildren to live theirs as well. Everyone says I should be dead. I should have died like Arbery, like Floyd. But by God's grace, the spirit within me refused to let me die with a knee on my neck. So now there's 50 million blacks in America. Multiplied by five equals $250 million a month. That's 200 new black millionaires between the ages of 18 and 27 per month, 2,400 a year, and the means to pay those who secure those contracts. In the time the task force has been doing its work, we've missed out on embedding roughly 7,800 new black millionaires into the pipeline of our congressional duty. Sir, thank Do you. Do it yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our, our next uh, speaker can approach the mic, please. Um, our next speaker, thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. That should be um, Mahar Boyle Hassan. And if that person's not here, Roy Lee. Roy Lee is next. Good morning. Good morning, Task Force. Yes. My name is Roy Lee. Um, I represent the Bay Area, Kingdom Warriors Foundation, HHF. Um, I'm here today to say thank you guys for your hard work, but it's one word that I wanna say is redemption. And we need to be redeemed for all the hurt, all the harms. America is supposed to be united, United States. We not, we've been divided for a long time. Our people have been divided so it's great to know that we come together to be unified for this moment, to stand up, to be heard, to be seen, to be felt. And this is our legacy. We're going to stand on it. If y'all don't want to give it to us, we're going to take it. God bless. OK, next speaker, sh thank you, sir, should be Jonathan Booker Bohanan. Thank you. You have two minutes. Uh, good morning. Uh, the entire world is watching what we are going to do here in California. This should be an effort on the federal level because we in California are not the only people deserving reparations. What if the people who marched from Selma to Montgomery were marching for their right to vote and their right only? If and when we get reparations here, I urge you all to consider what we will say to the people just like us in Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas, Texas, who won't get a single dime. Are we going to tell them to all move here? Are we going to shun them and tell them to beat the mountain of racism they face every day in the Deep South? It might hurt some of us to say this now, but now is the time to be selfless, not selfish. Either way, if these efforts initially end up being limited to the state of California, we have to be united around a foundational plan that makes so much sense that it is unattackable as possible and can be adopted everywhere, including the Deep South. I have a plan that can do that. I don't want us to be fighting for reparations for the next 50 years. I stayed away from topics like this for years because we talk about it forever with no realistic solutions. Right. I'm very delighted to say these efforts in California have changed my mind. This is the first year I'm getting involved because black people are not at all incapable. But at the same time, we shouldn't be viewed as some sort of superhuman race who are expected to be able to participate in this game of monopoly against all odds, where most if not all the property is already owned due to a concentrated racist effort to stop black prosperity. Understand that the opposition is not made up of stupid people. These people are lawyers, the United Daughters of the Confederacies to who are still thriving today and even religious zealots who are ready and willing to misuse Christianity and the word of God. We have to be extremely tactful and this will require extreme ingenuity because like the woman who was speaking at the beginning of yesterday, reparations won't end discrimination. I have a plan that a few of you on the panel as well as a few people in the audience now have a copy of entitled the Silver Lining Act of 2023. 
We can beat the opposition. I'm available to share the plan to anyone interested. It's a plan that I believe is very likely to actually pass and address a wide range of issues as well as the shortcomings we didn't anticipate in 1965 that just about everyone has brought up so far. My name is Jonathan Bohannon, and like you and many others in this room and people all over America, I'm here to help make this happen. Let's make history. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, our next, our next speaker should be um, Josiah Williams. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, task force members. My name is Josiah Williams. I'm with the American Redress Coalition of California and the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California. I wanted to start off by saying that we appreciate all the work that you're doing to help our community. Um, we also appreciate the vote for, the, um, for eligibility for the, the descendants of U.S. chattel slavery as being the eligible party. Um, we encourage you to ensure that the proposals that come out is also aligned with that. After reading some of them, I understand that you know, they're still being worked on, but a lot of them are kind of, they include some all lives matter language. And so we want to make sure that it's going to be structured to actually help the specific uh, community that was harmed. Yeah. Um, in addition, I agree with what was said regarding the federal reparations effort as well. We can take what's going on in the state of California and actually use that as a federal program. We know that there's other <laughs> efforts that's in place, but they are staying still. And so we want to allow California to lead the nation uh, in this justice effort. Um, in addition, we discussed talking about um, the federal, um, basically uh, the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, we believe that it should be an independent agency instead of being an oversight committee. We want to ensure that the agency is actually able to enact change. We don't want the ability to be put in the hands of just a group of CBOs. We believe that some can actually contribute, but we also know that um, in, in a lot of cases, the pursuit of justice is pretty much the, the effort that is going on and it's not actually in achieving justice. So you, you get these organizations that end up just being able to sustain themselves while the community stay in the same place. And so we want to ensure that the community um, organizations that is included is actually invested into achieving justice for the community. And I think that a Freedmen's Bureau will be able to assist with that effort. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before our next speaker, I believe the, the mayor of Sacramento has um, come in. Oh, thank you. All right. Okay. We'll continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Our next speaker is uh, Lamont Collins. Please come on down. Good morning. My name is Lamont Collins. I'm a member of the Monterey Park Track community in Stanislaus County near Modesto, California, a community established in uh, 1941 uh, when my great-grandmother's mother brought her here from Oklahoma to get away from Tulsa. And uh, in 2023, we're still facing the same things. Like I heard the sister say yesterday about her family wanting to create Black Wall Street in, uh, in Allensworth. Well, my people had the same vision for Monterey Park track and series, and we're still suffering from the, the water contamination, discrimination, land seizures through uh, eminent domain and those types of things. Still today, my people came and they bought a lot of land. My family, uh, half of that community is owned by my father's side, the other half is owned by my mother's side. And we have very little of that land left. Ain't nobody left fighting for it but me and my cousin. And like my people did then, I'm willing to do it now and fight for that shit, you know what I'm saying? And I wanna know, how can I get a panel like this to Stanislaus County? Cause I happen to find out about this word of mouth, not through the radio or the TV or none of that. And I've been in a meeting like this before down in the basement of a church where the black people was giving away millions of dollars to black business owners and nobody knew. I happen to know cause of who I was related to. And I wanna bring that up and I'd like you to Google Juanita Jackson of Ceres, California, if you have the time. Look her up on Legacy.com if you have the time. R-H-H-R WordPress.com if you have the time. And you'll see why I fight. Because she sat with Huey and tried to right the wrongs. She was with Alex Haley when he wrote the book about the very shit that we're talking about now. And I just want to know, when, how and when are we going to really get some help? There's a line in this room that's so thick and we all come from the same tree. And if you listen to the white man that we all following and listening to, he told you as a black woman that brought us here. 
She was the first. So what are we, what are we arguing about about? I'm this black or I'm that black. We all black. And when you walk outside and the police get on your ass, you ain't gonna tell him I'm this or I'm that. This is my first meeting here. I don't know what the division is about and I don't pretend to know, but whatever it is, it need to go. We need sir, to get on the same boat, same sir, thing. Sir, like they thank threw you. Us all in the same boat and brought us here. Thank you for coming out today. We really appreciate your comments. I, I hope you thank appreciate you. it enough to come help us out. Thank, thank you. Please. Thank, thank you. Okay, our, ne our next speaker should be Tierra Ryder. Tierra Ryder or Tony Tinker Loken? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, task force members. Thank you for the work that you have been doing. I've been following you since the beginning. And the only thing I can think of is, Member Tamaki, you were absolutely right. We have things that we're going to face that we have no idea. This is going to divide our community in ways that we have yet to see. What I am here today to tell you is that make sure, if you do nothing else, that the blueprint that you put forth, the recommendations that you put forth are clear. I'm a person who worked on ethnic studies. I'm a person who worked on many, many bills that comes out of Sacramento. And I will tell you, once you are all gone, it'll be left to us to implement your words and your voices. And too many times I've seen money come in and it's gone before it ever hits the community. And you know why? Because there's all these administration costs before it ever hits the ground. So you need to leave us with your voices. You need to make sure that we are on board with you in each of these counties to make sure that we can continue your work forward. Otherwise, we're gonna be left. Your economist was right on. She said, I'm hoping to leave a blueprint for people to continue this work because this is the only, the first step. Now, I applaud you because suddenly people are up here speaking, and I remember in the beginning it was shut off. Okay? That's what's going to happen once you leave. Make sure that the DOJ leaves us with the ability to go into the wills, into the probates, into the places that we need to go. Because otherwise, we're going to start from the beginning and have to fight. Call us, take our names, take our numbers, come back to us. Thank you. If you want this to be successful, talk to all of us that have come here to make comments. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for, your, thanks for coming out today. Uh, next should be Friday Jones. Good morning. Good morning, I'm free running today, so bear with me. I'm Friday Jones, my name is Consa Jones Muhammad. I'm a commissioner for the city of LA, president of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, founding member of a coalition for a just and equitable California. Couple of things, one, thank you all for agreeing to uh, in live sessions. Uh, if you could add some Fridays and Saturdays because of the four dates you put on the table, only one is a Friday and we are working people and two days off of work is a bit much to ask of us. Two, SB 51, uh, we need to support that cannabis bill that Senator Bradford uh, wrote, it's equity in the cannabis space. We also uh, need to support Sam Brown's uh, ending of uh, slavery and servitude in the state of California. So I want people listening outside of this room uh, to support those efforts and that work. And as far as the prison uh, population is concerned, I went inside and talked to a prisoner. San Quentin News, Los Angeles Sentinel, Bay View, Ear Hustle Podcast. That is how the prisoners can find out what's going on because there have been no accommodations by the state in order to communicate with them and check in on their needs. Uh, last, the beneficiary classes, I understand it is, uh, d define the community of eligibility based on lineage determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of chattel enslaved persons or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century. Uh, that needs to be your language, like in an agreement. The beneficiary class, that's the definition. All these other terms, words, lose them in the reports and in the final recommendations because it lacks clarity. Finally, I am a descendant of the Shinnecock Nation in New York. 
I understand that my great-great-grandfather, Jahu Miller, who is mixed with French, uh, is Blackfoot Shinnecock Nation Indian. I'm fully aware that my great-grandmother, Tracy, seven generations back, was imported into Charleston, South Carolina. I know who I am. I know who the white people are that purchased my family. I know who my indigenous nation is. I do not understand all of this animosity that we have with this gang-banging of whose name, A-D-O-S, F-B-A, Freedman, I don't care. Ms. Jones, the definition Jones, has been defined. Thank you. And y'all need to knock thank, it all away. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for much. My time. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Okay. All right. Next, next, next should be Thomas Williams. Is Thomas Williams here? All right. Come on up. All right. You may begin, sir. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, Task Force. Honorary of my dad. Bishop William Wendy Williams uh, of Kingdom Warriors. I want to speak about the, the black, the Port of Oakland, 25%, for the blacks is owed to them. And um, I need for uh, um, Sheriff Department, Police Department, Task Force, and the press to find my missing daughter, Shanika. Yes. Missing for two years. If it's one white person that's missing, the news would be on the first day. Yeah. Black people media don't get no press. We still in slavery, 400 years of oppression. How long is going to last? When is put in? We still in bondage. How long will this continue? Get back to Black Wall Street. Yeah. Time is now, now is for never. Find my missing daughter, Shanika. Bring her home. Yeah. Thank you, Task Force. Yeah. God bless. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, next should be Thea Austin. Is Thea here today? Please come on down. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I just want to um, make a brief com comment and um, favorable peace and blessings to the conscious collective of the 21st Century Freedmen's Bureau, serving the people, African descendants of American slavery, who have endured genocidal holocaust. I'd like to appeal to all regarding reparations. Legislation needs to continue to be awakened and touched by the debt owed by the government to past traumas, past hurts created for our black American psyche, nervous system, general way of life. I want to thank the people who made me aware and brought me here and say that we need to appeal to all regarding reparations and lift every voice, right the wrongs of the past so that the future can be better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to come in. Uh, the next speaker on the list is Alexander Brannon. Please, good morning, sir. Peace and reparations. Good morning to the task force and all the uh, participants here today. My name is Jay Alexander. I'm a proud veteran, Prince Hall Freemason, and a freedman. I grew up in Compton in South Central Los Angeles during the 1970s and the 1980s. I'm amongst the first children to benefit from a fully integrated schools and many of the benefits granted after the Civil Rights Movement. I've experienced black communities striving and growing with black wealth. In Los Angeles, many black people were working at Boeing's, McDonald, McDonald Douglas, and Raytheon companies, and I remember an abundance of black families, black unity, home ownerships, business ownerships, and school teachers. My own grandfather, Roger Rain, supported his family as a private contractor. Empowerment groups like the Black Panthers and Freemasonry were present in the Nation of Islam and black churches as well. After school programs, holiday parades, and community centers existed in these communities as did free lunches and swim lessons. Then came the 80s and Reaganomics. Guns and crack were released on our people. I came of age as our black community's businesses, along with our beautiful people, were being decimated by aggressive policing and, crack, and the crack epidemic. I returned home from the Army 21 days after the Rodney King riots to a city still smoking. I believe the Freedmen Bureau should be reinstated and reestablished throughout the entire nation, especially here in California. Lastly, I make the statement on behalf of my ancestors walking in the footsteps of two great men. Prince Hall, who was a freedman, voter, property owner, and community activist who established the first and longest existing black fraternity in the nation at the same time that the nation was being formed. And Colonel Allen Allensworth, who was also a freedman and established the first all freedman town here in California, just north of Bakersfield, where I currently reside. This town, these towns, this town was sabotaged along with many of Black Wall Streets and our communities. Reparations will repair this nation. Thank you. Amen. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, let's see. Next should be Karen Burney. Is Karen here this morning? Otherwise, we have Gail Wil Wilkerson. Is Gail here this morning? Next, we have Matthew Burgess. Good morning. You have two minutes, please. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair Moore. Thank you, honorable members of the task force. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm here to speak to you as a fifth generation Californian. And as much as my words are important, it's important for you to hear the words of our ancestors as well, because they still speak. Um, about where my grandmother's house was. And the uh, peace chiefs were you know, in above there. And between there, well, you know where the Burgess line, you know. See, Burgess come out, joined with us, and staked at the whole business. But, uh, Those words were from Jimmy Minro one of the last living descendants on the, Mar on the Monroe side of the blood uh, brought to Coloma. His ancestors were brought to Coloma as well as slaves. Um, you see, we were formerly enslaved. Mr. Monroe, he's talking about land. He's talking about the peaches that my grandfather, great-grandfather produced. And see, we joined together because we were formerly enslaved people, but we were more than joined by just not just names, it was blood too. But we joined to cultivate and restore land and distribute fruit and all those things that every person wants as far as an opportunity. But during that time, and sometime, there was the state plotting to take land. You see, he said the state took over the business. Well, what business are we talking about? We're talking about the business of agricultural. This is a farm to fork region and farm and fruit was produced in those lands, vital fruit. But at the same time, my folks and ancestors were brought here as slaves and enslaved and sold here that we can prove we have Levi Strauss. Now, Mr. Strauss immigrated from Germany in 1853. The irony here is that my great grandfather was brought here as a slave and worked in the gold mines in 1850. Mr. Strauss, on the other hand, built a brand in San Francisco. The irony here is we talked about mass incarceration. We talked about the criminal justice system, but no one's talked about the brand that Levi Strauss built with government contracts, starting from 1875 to 1901. Mr. That's Burgess, a lifetime sentence, I'm, I'm so we sorry. We have family members spending lifetime sentences to in prison, interrupt but you. The government gave us a contract in the of your for 25 sentence? years. But the thank sentence you. of slaves, we want we contracts have, for 25 two, years in minutes, perpetuity. Sir? We don't just want the right. But thank you so much. Your 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 comments are recorded. Next next we have Tanya Burgess. Uh, or, or, Tanya's not going to be here. Okay, so. Jonathan. Yes. All right. Thank you. Please go ahead. You have two minutes, please. Thank you. Great, uh, Madam Chair, members of the task force. First of all, I want to thank you for your work that you've done so far. But I also want to talk about Reverend Brown. Something you would know. My great grandfather. See, um, he wrote to the Pacific Pill newspaper in 1880, 1870, about the colored kids being turned away from school. And what he said was that, to the Colored Citizens Convention, I don't know what you call yourselves doing, convention, but these kids were turned away from school. Now, I'll tell you guys, as a colored folk task force, I don't know what you're doing, but I want you to push this through, just like my great granddaddy said. He also spoke about miscarriages of justice. In fact, the last hanging in Coloma he spoke about, I wonder how a man of his age could talk about a hanging, 1857. He said it was a miscarriage when the black man, the Negro man was hung for being accused of a robber and the white man was hung for raping the Negro man's wife. It was deemed that they both were to be hung. He said it was a miscarriage of justice. Now he said a number of things were miscarriage of justice. So I'm gonna tell you guys something. It would be a miscarriage of justice to our ancestors for you to allow these economic people not to total up the land of those ancestors from the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, 80s that were on the census records that just pooped and disappeared. I asked myself why there are no white folks on this panel I understand because I had a friend tell me as a 14 year old girl, she told me just recently what she heard over a campfire in Placerville about the lynchings and the hangings and pushing people off of cliffs for land. So it's a miscarriage of justice for you guys not to tell how in 1988 governor, previous governor of California who became the president Ronald Reagan, resurveyed land that belonged to black pioneer families 400 acres worth. That's a miscarriage of justice. 
It would be a miscarriage of justice for you guys not to allow these people to sign these checks, total up the lands for the people that we don't know about. See, my family, we got deeds and receipts that go back from 1870. It's a miscarriage of justice for you to allow novice people to go on the state website and speak the rhetoric like it's the gospel, saying that my great-grandfather only owned 10 acres of land when he got a deed in 1877 from a guy that was the Supreme Court Justice in California. It's a miscarriage of justice to remove the white folks that did the right thing for black folks in history. It's a miscarriage of justice for our educational systems to teach people like the person in Placerville that called yesterday to talk about the Confederates, right, that brought slaves that ended up being supervisors, judges, lawyers, book writers, Sir, right? thank you, thank and you so much. Your, your two state. minutes are up, but feel free to submit your comments in writing. The task force does want to hear from you, and thank you for taking the time to come out. Thank you, and this was not directed at any you do your job. Thank I you. Appreciate thank, you. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Next, we have Marion Johnson, and then uh, last on the list is Michael Johnson, and then we'll check do a check-in with the task force. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Marian Johnson, and I am a former resident of Russell City. As an infant, I was one of those families that was forced out. Um, I had two sides of my family that were located there, my father's side, my mother's side. My father's side owned 10 uh, plots. My mother's side owned two plots. My parents were put out and giving nothing, no resources. And that was by choice. Uh, when the county decided to take our land by eminent domain, they opted out of getting federal funding. So they were able to take that land that they took from us to sell that land to private industry. And the money that they got from selling the land, they used that money to purchase land to build Santa Rita Jail, which, after taking us and moving us out of Russell City, they forced us into places like East Oakland where I lived. We were over-policed. And of course, when the drugs dropped in our communities, well, they had a place to put us now, Santa Rita Jail. They took our land to put us in jail. The schools that we had, insufficient. Old books written in. How are we supposed to get a good education? I was in the gifted program, so I, I had better classes, so-called. But when I moved to Oklahoma for three years, I learned that that education was insufficient because I was put in basic classes when I got there. And I came back to California my junior and senior year, focused. I, got, I graduated at the top of my class, and I went on to college. But all of my classmates who had suffered from what had been done in Russell City were not afforded that same opportunity. I say, if you want to find out how much is owed, follow the money. Start with the money they used to buy that land to build Santa Rita and backtrack it. And you'll find out how to decide what it is we are owed. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am, for coming out. Thanks for your valuable comments this morning and your contribution. Our last speaker on the list this morning is Michael Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Johnson. Marion's my sister. I am from Oakland, California. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Time is of the essence, so I'll be brief. Let me begin with these three words. Russell City Apology. If you could please grab your phones, type these three words into your favorite internet search engine, Russell City Apology. During yesterday's session, you heard from expert group of eco e economists to provide an update of the five harms, the first of which was unjust property taking by eminent domain. Dr. Campbell made it clear that they've been facing huge challenges putting their hands on the data needed to support the methodology they'd like to pursue. That data that they need includes, one, what happened? Two, which neighborhoods were impacted? Three, how much would those individuals pay for the land? Four, the value of that land today so they can determine the gap between what was paid and what that land is worth today. 
If they had that data, they could use it to extrapolate it to other communities in California where eminent domain was used to let's call it what it is, stealing land from black people. Ladies and gentlemen, all the data she needs for what she described exists for Russell City. I sit on the steering committee of the Russell City Reparative Justice Project. In August of last year, the city of Hayward contracted with researchers to begin collecting the very data Dr. Campbell is looking for. On Monday, March 6, our committee will be meeting with those researchers to provide us with the data they, they have uncovered. Russell City holds the answers to questions the California Reparations Committee has on how to quantify the harm caused by the unjust property taking by eminent, to, eminent domain. Russell City Apology. Look it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that concludes the uh, folks who didn't get a chance to speak yesterday, who came out again today. So thank you very much, um, Chair Moore and task force members. We also have the mayor here today. This may be a good time to have the mayor, and then you can decide how you want to proceed sure. following that. So now we will turn uh, to special acknowledgments. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce Mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg. Uh, Mayor Steinberg served 14 years in the state legislature and became the first Sacramentan to serve as president of the Senate in over 125 years. He authored landmark pieces of legislation, such as the Mental Health Services Act, a tax on millionaires that now produces more than $3 billion a year to fund mental health services in California, and SB 375, the first bill in the nation to require cities and counties to meet aggressive climate goals as they plan their long-term growth. After leaving the legislature in 2014 due to term limits, he founded the Independent Steinberg Institute, which today has become the leading voice on mental health policy and legislation in California. Elected as Sacramento's mayor in 2016, he has guided the city through a slow economic recovery from the recession, the pandemic, and the long overdue reckoning around race and equity, including the creation of the city's first racial equity committee and his office's commitment to working with the community on developing local level reparations in support of state and federal reparations. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mayor Steinberg. You, you can be in your Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and to all the members of the task force, including several of my uh, former legislative colleagues, it's good to be with you today. Um, and I want to welcome you to uh, the city of Sacramento, the capital city, but also a city that prides itself on, uh, on its commitment to equity, justice, and inclusion. Um, I'm humbled joining you all today as I've had the opportunity to listen and learn. Um, and I did Google um, what the gentleman described about what went on in Hayward in the Bay Area, Russell City, um, and there's so much to learn. I have a lot to say about what's in my heart and what brings me here, why I wholeheartedly support reparations and think everyone should. Mm -hmm. I thank you for reflecting on some of my own record of uh, progressive public service to our most disadvantaged communities. If government should stand for anything, it's, it should stand for investing in communities and people who have been the victims of discrimination and disenfranchisement for far too long. For me, it ultimately comes down to a few simple things that are often hard for us to say from these positions of elected representation and power or privilege. But let me try in just my few moments. Most importantly to my community, as your mayor, I am sorry, and I am humbled to work alongside all of you to repair our city's, our city's history of harm together. Redlining and so much more. The time is now. And f as one leader like you, I will continue to dig deep to learn and to work on myself as an individual and as a leader to do this work, not for you, with you. Amen. This brings me to my next point. Government at all levels throughout history and today 
play a key role in the discrimination, in the disparity, in the disenfranchisement, in the disparagement of our African-American communities. And while we as government officials and representatives must take a long overdue and active role in working to acknowledge and fully repair these harms, we must do so in a way that is not top-down, that empowers the very people at the center of those harms, as you're hearing from over these last several days, to lead the way as true partners in the process from start to finish, not the other way around. Your report, I know, will be guided by what you're hearing from the people, and so will our work in the city. And finally, I know you know this, this is just a start. And what you are doing as leaders of this task force, what we are doing here today and throughout cities across the country, it is just a start because you can't make up for hundreds of years of discrimination with one task force or one bill or one legislative session. But if we use this as a strong beginning to build, to evolve, and adapt as we learn from one another about what works. I mean, I learned today about land. I mean, I heard today about eminent domain, something that even locally I hadn't yet thought about and focused on. That's powerful. But together, we need to stay together because there are going to be legal challenges. There's going to be oppositional pushback. You can already see it coming. And so this is the start not just of the powerful ideas, but the coalition that is going to be necessary to actually get something meaningful done for our community, for the African-American community that has suffered for far too long. So I just wanted to come and offer my voice as one elected official, as one mayor, to say that um, we not only stand with you, but prepared to do anything um, to to remedy what's wrong and to make sure that we actually have a city and a society where every kid's got an equal chance because they go to a quality school. Every neighborhood is seen as a good and great neighborhood, not a neighborhood that's set aside or that, that um, is over-policed or not paid attention to. This is a great opportunity here and like always, California can show the way. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. And we'll have Vice Chair Brown have some remarks as well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I hope you will beg. <clears throat> Pardon me, me. As Vice Chair of this body, to first of all admit that it is significant that you came. I applaud your presence and your words. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And in order for me to leave this podium in good conscience, I must share with you that one might consider to be providential a coincidental that I had in my briefcase, I didn't know you were coming today, this book entitled The Troubled Life of Peter Burnett, Oregon pioneer and first governor of California by R. Gregory Noakes. This man, this soul, was so evil. He lived in this city. And as the book indicates, it's the first governor of this state. Where did he come from? Came from Nashville, Tennessee. And in 1843, he led the first wagon train westward. 
over the Oregon Trail. And before he got to Oregon, he had already established the rule that no black or mulatto would be permitted to be a part of that wagon train. And if they were in the wagon train, they would have to be enslaved persons. And when he got to the Oregon Territory and settled that little town, Germantown, his first act of business was not how a road should be built or how a cabin should be built. It was an inhumane, evil ordinance that no blacks or mulattoes would be permitted to settle in that town. And if they were caught in that town, they would be beaten every six months until they left town. He didn't stop his evil there. When gold was struck in 1848, he left Oregon. But let me say parenthetically too, that ordinance stayed on the books of the state of Oregon until 1926. But back to Sacramento, when he got down here, he got involved in politics. And to make the whole story short, and emerged to become the first governor of this state. And when he got in that governor's seat, he still wouldn't stop his racist, bigoted policies and practices. He tried to get an ordinance, a legislation, that no blacks would be able to settle in California at all, at all. Thank God he was not able to get it through. But he wouldn't stop there. He was slick and sleazy. He even emerged after he left office in disgrace to be on the state Supreme Court in 1857. 1857, everybody from Mississippi out there, stand up. Stand up. 1857. In 1857, a man named Charles Stovall from my native state of Mississippi came to Sacramento to build a school and for his help. And what does Stovall do? He tried to keep one, R.C. Lee, enslaved here, even though California was supposed to have been a free state. Long short of it, friends, is that that case of R.C. Lee became the first civil rights case of the West. And R.C. Lee was set free only because persons at First AME Zion Church in San Francisco, along with the Baker and Broderick brothers who were abolitionists, were able to set him free. But that man, Peter Burnett, voted to send R.C. Lee back to Mississippi enslaved. So what we need to do, I respectfully submit, we need to repute the legacy of that troubled Peter Burnett and give an apology to black folks for all of the evil of racism and bigotry that he was able to utter and to infect this state with. I think I rest my case. Amen. 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 I, I, I don't think I want to have the last word here. Uh, no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. So public comment is formally over, but we understand that folks took the time out on a Saturday. Uh, to come out, and so we will allow folks to speak um, until, I don't know, the person behind, I don't know, the, the blue. Um, 
let's try let's try to um, be as brief as as we can. So um, one minute ish would be would be great. One one minute and a half because we have actual real business that we really need to take care of, but we want to make sure that folks are heard. So con let's continue. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Next speaker, you have one minute. In fairness to everyone, please try to take one minute. We know what you have to say is very important to the task force. Please begin. I Welcome. I from Los Angeles last night, y'all. Okay. So I'm going to try to make this quick. My name is Sharice Cryer, and I'm a lawyer. I've been licensed since 2006, and I've been in reparation circles since about 2018. And one of the suggestions that I made while in the reparation circle was for the Freedmen Affairs Bureau to be reactivated. That was my concept. But no one from any organization, and neither has this task force, asked me what I meant. So we have a concept without context. Matter of fact, Reggie John Sawyer, I am your constituent. I have been reaching out to your office for about the past two months, and now we have a back and forth about what is meant by the Freedmen's Bureau. Last April, when we had the in-person hearing, I presented everyone on the task force, with the exception of Mr. Sawyer, because you were out of the, uh, the country, with um, a concept. And it was a reparation super fund, and it included what does the Bureau of Freedmen Affairs look like, and how should it be ran? i.e. it should be ran like the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Where is the expert from the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Where is the local tribal expert to come and provide testimony? There should be no back and forth. I've given you the uh, blueprint and the concept. Also, this is my final point, this commission has been leading with uh, international law. To the lawyers on the task force, that's a red herring. You already have California federal law established. What does the Bureau do? What does the Bureau of Indian Affairs do? Who's on the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Who leads it? We need to stop leading with international law that is misdirecting us and giving us information that we don't need. We need to look to see what California does with the Bureau thank of Indian you, thank Affairs you, and also what it does, uh, how it interacts with the state. Thank, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming out. Okay, next speaker, one minute, let's go. <laughs> My name is Reginald Romain. I was here yesterday. First of all, I want to give uh, respect to Tyreek Nichols from here who, who passed away uh, by them cops. Uh, you know, you saw what he did. They did to him. You know what I'm saying? But uh, past that, independent party, uh, that's what we need. Uh, are you Democrats and Republicans that black people? Leave it alone. I'm going to have a sign. I'm going to have a, a piece of paper outside. We're going to have a new party. It's going to be called the 1619 Reparations Party. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Henry Harry. I'm a resident of uh, Sacramento, and I'm making some edits on the go here. So my roots go back to the state of Mississippi, experiences of segregation, extreme fears of being black, and stories from my grandfather about our family that reach back to the days of slavery. Here's a quick passage from a book I'm working on. Quote, some of my childhood memories are very good ones. They are tied to an incredible sense of connection to the land and the place we call home. Even in the oppressive atmosphere of the Deep South, a certain wholeness existed in blacks. This community bond was enhanced by another important fact. These people owned their land. Many people still lived on land that had been passed down through their family or they had actually purchased land because the opportunity to buy it had not been pushed outside their reach. My point is this. We must not fail to see the opportunity for California, the feds, and cities like Sacramento to make reservation-style land grants part of their reparations efforts. And let's remember, this money that we're seeking, it doesn't belong to us. This money and land belongs to generations of blacks, generations who suffered rapes, beatings, children being sold, and many other barbaric acts that uh, come up to this day. Thank we you, sir. We have an incredible opportunity and responsibility. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for coming out. And sir, remember to put the mic in front of you so that your words will be recorded. Thank you. Have one minute. Thanks. Good morning. Wakanda forever. <laughs> Take two. Madam Chair, members of the California Reparations Task Force, those of you here in the audience and then listening at home, I'm Morris Griffin. 
I'm better known as Big Money Griff, strong community activist, leader, and problem solver. Yesterday, I didn't get a chance to say the one thing that I wanted to say, and that is yearly installments. We are demanding $5,000 every single month to the day we die. Now, either we can do that every two months or every month is what you decide. But that's where I'm coming from straight out. And when we talk about the national reparations, we talk about the task of all the different cities that was massacred because we were thriving. Thank you, so sir. Thank I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The task force heard, heard your second point very clear. Thank you so much. We're so sorry. But again, to try to hear from everyone today. We really appreciate your patience, everyone. Thank, thank you. Next speaker, please come forward. I, and, and please, next speaker, please come forward. And uh, turn the mic. Make sure you're speaking into the mic. You have one minute. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, all. My name is Phoenix Starr, and I'm from Inglewood, California. And I am here to appeal to the mass media and social media to communicate correct information about our quest for California reparations. While California was not a slaveholding state, it acted as one. So for those who need clearer understanding supported by data and facts, read the first sub report submitted by California DOJ. This will explain how and why we as Freemen require and deserve repair from policies that have hurt and harmed us historically up to present. Look around you and you will see in real time the manifestation of these policies. And as Marcel Dixon says, fix black America, you fix America. Peace and blessings to you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Next speaker, please. Oh. Uh, good morning. Morning. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Lloyd Kelly. I'm from New Orleans. I'm going to try and make this short. I see. I, I know there are two members of the uh, California Congressional Black uh, our Congressional Black Caucus. Not. I'm sorry. Two members of the California Legislative Black Caucus are on this panel. There are 12 members of the California Legislative uh, Black Caucus. This is supposed to be the last meeting, public meeting. Where the hell are those other members of the Congressional Black, of the California Legislative Black Caucus? Because they're the ones that are going to be voting on this. Where are they? As we said yesterday, California, there's been two things that have happened to us that are very important. One is emancipation. Number two is going to be reparations that California comes up with. Where the hell are the Congressional Black Caucus members? We have no leadership. We've been standing up here telling you, but y'all don't have the vote in Congress or in the legislature. I w I'm from New Orleans, and when we had this little flood, or this little thing called uh, Hurricane Katrina, Ray Nagin said, Mr. President, bring your ass down here. I'm saying Congressional Black Caucus members and California uh, uh, Congress uh, uh, legislative members, S sir, bring your ass down here to you. these meetings thank, today. Thank, thank you for and coming with out. that, I yield my time. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Please come forward. You have one minute. Please come forward. Come to the mic. Thank you. Good morning. You have one minute. Thank you. Oh, good morning. I'm going to try and uh, put sort of a mixed message across here real quick. Uh, first of all, things like land taking or uh, L.A. County shuffling around underperforming teachers to, to black schools. That needs to change. That needs to stop. At the same time, um, this commission has talked about repealing equal protection laws in California and given cash grants to people to buy homes or to support businesses. And uh, that's, a, that's a 14th Amendment issue. You'd have to repeal the 14th Amendment first, and that's done so much for, for black folks, for folks of all races, religious minorities. Um, gay people can get married because of the 14th Amendment. That's standing in your way. I'm sorry um, if, if you want to hand out money like that. So 
What I'm saying is uh, either you do it in a race neutral way, fixing schools, fixing eminent domain, or you, uh, you listen to the people here, you, uh, you just hand out money, you get your ass handed to you in court, and it, it sets everything back, and it shows just how ridiculous and uh, shameful that whole endeavor is. Uh, that's all I got, thank you. Next speaker, you have one minute. Uh, Good I think morning. That warrants an extra 30 seconds or so. So um, I hate to be an alarmist, but here's the alarm, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Let's see. Thank you. Yeah. Please go so ahead. Here's, here's the alarm that I want to give, right? Right now, the task force is considering the Freedmen's Bureau, right? The future of the Freedmen's Bureau. Will it be a, an organization that writes a letter to, uh, I guess, other organizations and departments and says, hey, you're doing a bad job? Or will it be a serious organization that is going to be black Americans in charge of their own repair? In the same way that Professor Lewis said, hey, we, we have to do something here. We have to understand and recognize these people's self-determination. I hope your vote will reflect that today. In the same way that Lisa Holder talked about how she's faced medical racism, guess what? We're going to need a Freedmen's Bureau to fight that. In the same way that Tamaki believes that reparations is somehow gonna end all racism and that's the goal, I hope his vote will reflect a robust Freedmen's Bureau because we need an organization that's going to fight for us. We cannot depend on these nonprofits. We cannot depend on shadowy organizations like the ones that Cheryl Grills hired that funnel $500,000 to God knows where. Don't smile at me, Cheryl. It is true. And if, you, and if it is not true, Cheryl, you should call for an investigation. You should call for an investigation right now and make a motion. You will not because you are scared. Your time of is up, sir. Thank you. All right, next speaker. You have one minute, please, and speak into the mic. Good morning, you may begin. Oh, that's gonna be hard to follow up. Um, what's up, everybody? Thank you to the task force, mem um, task force members who have been doing their thing thus far. Camilla, you know, number one up here. I'm gonna make it real quick. First off, um, this bit with the communication firm is a grave mistake. People have talked about it, we know it but we actually have to fix it. There's not enough people in this room and there's not enough people who are aware of what's going on. And we need those people to galvanize once we're in our next phase of this. We need folks in the streets. I'm happy about the lineage base. We already know that's past tense. We know who this is for. Let's make sure in the final report the language reflects that so there's no room for questions. I'm throwing my support behind an independent agency not an oversight board, not a commission. We have to do this for us. There's no one else who's gonna to have to be able to push this through like we can. We need our own power to do this ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please come forward. You have one minute. Good Hello, morning. my name is Courtney McKinney. I live here in Sacramento and I have two likely imperfect points, but my intention is to contribute in the spirit of help, healing, accessibility, and productivity. The first is that we shouldn't be paying taxes. Our ancestors were violently forced from West Africa to build this economy for free for over 200 years and then terrorized for 100 more and counting. Our taxes have been paid and we are still owed a significant debt. California should immediately suspend tax collection for black people, especially considering how the state continues to oppress black people using tax money Money through policing and debt collection. We shouldn't be paying for that. Suspending taxes for black people in Cali won't break the budget since we constitute a small fraction of the population and it provides a model for options at the federal level, which is needed since black people are audited and harassed by the IRS at disproportionately high rates, stripping more wealth. This is an actual beginning for the path that America needs to take to begin to repay its debts. The second request I have is for public talking points and in general for this process to be made much more accessible. Please give us talking points, maybe five max, that synthesize the priority points of why reparations are needed in a simple, digestible way, easy enough to talk to with children. Examples might be that there's precedent for reparations, like for example, when the US paid victims of Japanese internment. Another might be bullet points for the proposed options and rationale for reparations eligibility. These are just examples and could be a great way to engage the public as has been spoken about as needed. So please Thank you. help us help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Next speaker, come out. You have, you have one minute, you may begin. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Nazinga Griffin, and I would like to first thank the task force for choosing lineage-based reparations eligibility. Um, I want to request the final proposal be specific, not BIPOC, not POC, 
not universal, not race-based, not disadvantaged, not marginalized communities, and not all black people, but specific, just like your decision was a year ago in March. Please make sure that your um, language in the final proposal is lineage specific. Um, also, for the uh, communications firms, um, please do better. There's not enough people here. We haven't seen the commercials. The two that you played definitely did not um, appear to be anything near a million dollars spent. Um, and then also I am in full support of no oversight committee but the agency that you've been, we've been talking about for months now. We need the Freedmen's Agency, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please come forward. Good morning, sir, and uh, you have one minute. Thank you. Good morning. My, my name is Bentley Callender, and um, I am an insurance broker. I started school in Compton, California, and I finished school here in Sacramento, California. I am non-FBA, but I do want to uh, iterate that if, it's, if you're not of the FBA lineage, you do not qualify for reparations, and the reparations need to start with FBA. Along with that, the other problem is white supremacy, and all blacks need protection and, uh, by the law. The laws are already in place, they just need to be enforced, because we know what's going to happen if the, when the money starts to come into FBA, we know what white supremacy is going to do. So black people need to be uh, protected and don't muddy the waters with everything else that's being brought in. Um, it just needs to start with FBA. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. All right, next speaker. Hello, my name is Elmer Fonza, and I'm here to talk about Nelson Bell, one of the few African-American owners during the gold rush in Coloma, California. Nelson came to California by Mr. Bell in 1850 as a slave and was given his freedom shortly after. In 1856, as a free, Nelson Bell purchased several parcels of land, approximately 11 plus acres, in and around the town of Coloma, where he worked driving a water wagon and mining for gold. Nelson Bell passed away in 1869. At the time, his land and prop personal property was put into uh, probate. Personal property was later sold by the probate administration, but the sale of his land was not recorded in the probate. The land owner by Nelson Bell is now part of the California State Park. We have histor historical records and documents from a certified genealogist and information from Ancestry.com that indicates our kinship to Nelson Bell. It, he is, in fact, my third generation grandfather. Sir, I'm so sorry, but thank you so much for that historical information. And feel free to submit your comments to reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. Thank, thank you again for taking your time to come out. Next commenter, welcome. Peace to the tribe, peace to my ancestors. Um, yeah, uh, lineage base, reparations for sure. And definitely um, this Freedman Bank and Bureau and this whole movement that they have going on, we just don't believe it. You know, they stole money from black Americans before and they'll steal money from black Americans again. And honestly, um, some of the representatives out here um, I know the advertisement is not going too well with you all because we don't hear nothing from you all. But uh, as far as Freedman goes, uh, like, you know, ones like Marcel Dixon, or actually his name's Dixon Marcel from now on because he uh, betrayed his people and he's in Chicago promoting uh, 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 white candidates, uh, you know, over a black American uh, candidates and he's online <laughs> trolling and he's talking, you know, all types of mess about people. So. You know, forget him, he's a traitor. Now, as, as far as Naheem, uh, this guy goes by the name of Lord Abba. You know, he was telling black people, he was promoting to uh, black Americans to get the jab, basically just sending a curse on everybody. And I don't know what that guy's talking about. I just, I really don't know what he's talking about. No one should be listening to him. And he represents the Freedman Party. So, and if you think the grassroots are playing about the Freedman movement, ask Gabriel Pomonte in Chicago. So thank you, Chicago, and peace to the tribe. Sir, thank you. All right, next speaker. Good morning, you have one moment. Good morning, my name is Russell Clark. 
fourth generation uh, resident of Oakland, California, born and raised, town business in the building. Uh, I just want to uh, come here as a representative of the Clark family, second generation, skilled tradesman, elevator escalator worker, mechanic, I mean. And uh, I just want to bring the focus back to why we're having this reparation task force. The whole purpose is because us, descendants of slaves, foundational black Americans, were purposely and deliberately attacked at our land, our people. Uh, we were stolen, destroyed, and killed. The whole purpose of this is to bring our families the proper reparations we need, and that's a check from the Franchise Tax Board, number one, with all the rest of the uh, uh, parts of reparations. I want to thank you for the time and appreciate you for hearing me now. And uh, please, with the, I know you guys are stressed out, probably being attacked by white supremacists. I can't even imagine. But please, you are on the precipice of doing the right thing for not only for Foundation of Black Americans here in California, thank but you. for all of us in thank the United you, States of America. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Thank you very much. My name's Michael Crockett. You can adjust the mic closer. My name's Michael Crockett. I moved here, um, I, I jotted down a few things, where we are. Where we are right now is that, yes, it's hard to get a job. If a person, I heard a lot, I've heard a lot of comments and it, it brings up a lot. Where we are right now is we have issues. I think the panel, the task force, and I regret that I have not had the time to follow it as closely as some others, but so we are interdependent and relied on each other to keep ourselves in the know, I think if we're going to give reparations, and it should be money, I think the task force should consider some work. This might not go over so well. But this, um, uh, and I've heard many of the comments, one would be that eligible pe people would have to um, be educated, have some financial responsibility education, maybe a short course, just to inform them of the pitfalls We've heard about how people will be taken to court. We've heard about how land is grabbed. There are some slickers, and they will just bleed you dry, and we've heard about lottery winners who lose money. Sir, so thank you. Required. Thank you so much for that important well, point. That, I know, it goes fast. I'm so you. sorry, but and please, thank you're- you. I'd like to thank the task force for the, for the job you're doing and making this forum available for us citizens to get a, a chance to Thank you. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Sir, you may begin. Good morning. Uh, yet again, I'm here to keep this process honest. Yesterday, after I left um, from speaking, I heard someone from the Department of Justice uh, tell what I believe to be untruths, saying that they have no data on the discrimination um, against my people in this state. It, this is ridiculous. Uh, they don't know how many people are in their jails. They don't know how many warrants were issued, citations were issued, how many convictions are made. They don't know who's in those prisons. It's time to end the lies and the bullshit, right? And that's part of this process. It's called justice, reparations, justice, right? And so you're coming in here and telling lies from the Justice Department that they don't know what's happening in their state. That has to end. And so I'm out on that. I got to keep this on it. Thank you. There, there's six, six, six more people. So please come forward. You have one moment. Thank you. Good morning. My name is LaDonna Williams. Thank you so much for taking the time to address this important issue. I want to say, first of all, that our people deserve this $5 million now. As you are going through all of these processes and adding on more processes, you could benefit the people who have been harmed the most by paying out right now. Then that gives us the resources to work with you to move this issue forward. Yesterday, Richmond got up here and said they were going to follow Evanston. Evanston is not reparations. Richmond already has a home ownership program given $25,000. That doesn't work when the average home here is $600,000. You're giving us enough to fail. So understand this, that is not reparations. And second of all, um, um, 
when will you have the ordinary people who are the valuable people here on your panel as experts? We are the experts. You are here as an advisory board. You really have no power either. The people have the power. And when we recognize that, we're going to hold each one of you all accountable. And we appreciate the work you did, but Grills, we haven't forgotten you. Tamaki, we haven't forgotten you. Sawyer, we haven't forgotten that you all Thank voted you so against much. lineage. Thank you so much we for coming out today. We will take Thank our you. recommendations. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to come out today. All right, next speaker. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Melissa Muganzo, pronoun she, they, sis. Um, knowing that race is a social contrast and made up and has been, has been and continues to be resold to us, I wanted to make sure that I speak up for all black identified and black indigenous people who have been marginalized, suppressed, and harmed by living in and navigating the black experience. As someone born in Florida, born to African and West Indian parents, my experience along with theirs has been one of intentional discrimination and severe forms of medical racism, xenophobia, employment practices, housing policy, redlining, business loans, police brutality, in education. And as we consider reparations, let's be sure to not forget all the black people that have been impacted by the racist practices of the United States, including loss of tracking their lineage due to intentional white supremacy packages. Thank you so much for your time and your sacrificial historic time in taking on this matter. We appreciate you and we thank you. Next commenter. Thank you very much. Please speak into the mic, and you have one moment. Thank you so much. Good morning. Yeah, they, my staff told me we have a minute and a half. I won't be brief. I will be brief. First of all, I said it before. I'll say it again. I love you folks, and you folks are doing a tremendous job. I know the pressure you're under. God bless you, and you're doing a tremendous job. But there's some things you need to know. First of all, again, I say two hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars is not enough. 250,000 is not enough. 500,000 is not enough. What you need to do and you need to act now. Let me simplify all this for you. This is something you can act on now. The government has a quadrillion pieces of property worth quadrillions of dollars. That's above trillions. Act now and tell them to release our money now through assets and property. You can do that right now as I'm speaking today, and then we can get straight the money later. And we pay more taxes than everybody else. Stop this. We pay taxes too. As a group, we pay more taxes than anybody else. How? We're the number one spending group in America. We pay more sales taxes because of that than anybody. So give us our money now. We want our money now. Thank you. We want our assets now. Thank you very much. Next speaker, we have, uh, please come forward. Good, Good morning. morning, committee. My name is Michael Hunt. I now reside in Seattle, Washington. Born in Oakland, 1956. I've been listening to comments. I've been listening to people. I've been hearing recommendations. I want, I'm going to say this. If my people who call by my name would humble themselves and pray, Seek his face. Turn from your wicked ways. God said he would heal the land. I'm speaking for the people I saw on the tent as I drove to this building. Lines, those voices are silent. But they're out there. There's tents in Washington. Board, we got to start somewhere. Five million dollars would go a long way. Then we can go back and pick up some of the people on the street. We don't need the government to do it. We as a people need to do it. I represent Jesus Christ. I don't care what color you paint him, Jesus is the son of God. He gave his life. Now we turn back to God. He said he will heal this land. I'm standing on his word, people. We need to humble ourselves. Committee, God is right in everything that's being said, and he's going to write down what you guys do from this point on. Thank you. You Thank will you, sir. stand before God at the end of the day as all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Our last two speakers. Good morning. Please come on down. Spread the word what you heard. Spread the word. Spread the word. All right. Thank you, sir. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about the rent. Spread the word. Spread the word. Spread the word. So 
My time is just now starting. Forgive me, brother. Said spread the word. It's a song I had, I had written. Y- y'all see brother around the town with the, with the Jesus sign. Well, that's it. That's his song. We okay. So residual effects of slavery. The book this thick out there, right? That y'all 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 wrote, y'all read or whatever. Um, giving honor to God. Uh, I got a small prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. So we need residual pay, right? R- we need res- residual pay. I don't know how much money is in the trust fund already for, 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 the, for the payments or whatever, but as soon as the money drops, there needs to be a programs established from, from interest, from investment, so that residual payment can be made. Because when people are, are in third world conditions, third world things happen. They do third world things. And then we need easy access. Start reaching out to everybody eligible. It, of course, on the state level, we, we're going to be like a pillar state, an example, and then let it, let it, let it be an example for other states and the federal level for, for reparations where reparations are due. And then tax-exempt land, we need land. We pay more rent. We pay more money than, than, than anybody else. We pay, they call this liquid money. The Jews call colored people liquid money because money runs through our hands like water because we run to everybody else with our money. For us to have our own lands tax-exempt so we're not constantly paying rent because th- there was a campaign out, excuse my French, rent is too damn high. We need our own land. We, we put in a lot of work. I, I know I have. You see my hands. I'm, I'm a certified mechanic, CDL. I'm, 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 I, need, I need work as a CDL too. I got a truck sitting, sitting about across the street. Okay, my name is Patrick Blackshire, founder of Foundation of Future Success. I have a flower, flyer for each one of y'all. And um, if y'all have business cards, please provide that. Thank um, you, I sir. Appreciate you. Thank you. Please submit your written comments to reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. But thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Next speaker, our last speaker of the day. Good morning. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, peace and love. Aba Isini Hamage Garinagu, Honsun Hayabu Nyogunye. Blessings to everyone from the Garifuna Nation. Uh, to the reparations um, task force, thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, to those who are up there, we fear that you are doubting the people that are here. Who you're dealing with here today are the real ones. Every last individual in this building right now, and we will exemplify it to you in a second with the power of the fist in the air when we ask for those who are the real ones. So as you consider what you need to consider, consider two things. The real ones are not seeking autonomy. The real ones are seeking self-determination. Self-determination. So as you consider what you're considering, if there is not self-determination in it, you're failing the people. So now, to the real ones. Where are they at? Right here. The real ones. Where are they at? Right here. The real ones. Where are you at? Right here. Thank you, sir. Do Thank- not doubt the real ones. Thank you. Because they are here. Thank you. I say to our ancestors, I say to our ancestors, and the most honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey said that we are a Unitarian particle of the universal intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. That concludes our public comments this morning. Thank you all for your valuable contributions and rich history. The, I will turn the mic over to Chair Moore to continue the, this morning's agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin Walton. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item number 18, discussion and potential action. Advisory committee's recommendations on educating the public and formal apologies presented by members Tamaki and Grills. Chair Moore, <clears throat> I'm wondering, would it be appropriate to have, <clears throat> excuse me, a five minute break? Sure, we can take a break for five minutes, yeah. I think so, thank you. <clears throat> excuse me. Back around 11.25-ish. Come back to their seats. Do we have quorum? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, Parliamentarian Johnson, I'll turn to you to, um, well, we don't have to do that. Do we, okay. We do we need to establish a quorum? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin calling the roll uh, with Madam Chair. Present. Madam Chair is present. Vice Chair Brown. 
Present. Vice Chair Brown is present. Member Bradford? Here. Member Bradford is present. Member Grills? Present. Member Grills is present. Member Jones Sawyer? Member Jones Sawyer? Mem Member Jones Sawyer is absent. Member Lewis? Present. Member Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Stepp? Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Member Tamaki? Member uh, Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task. Present. Okay, um, Member Holder is present. And, Jones. and Member Joan Sawyer is present. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task force. It takes five for a quorum. The number present is nine. We have a quorum established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. We'll now turn to item 18, uh, presented by Member Tamaki and Member Grills. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Moore. I want to address as a, some prefacing with this uh, presentation of the public education plan. And it goes to the issue of the, the vote on lineage in March of, of 2022. And I think there's been some legitimate concerns spoken about that. And I just wanted to clarify if there, you know, to remove any doubt um, for both myself, for Cheryl Grills, and I think for every task force member, on the lineage question, the eligibility issue, the task force has spoken. The task force has spoken. And uh, as far as I can see, every task force member, including myself, intends to carry out the will of the task force, period. And so uh, I will say, and maybe this matters less, but from a, from a personal point of view, the uh, reality of a specific harm class of descendants, foundational black Americans, that needs to be acknowledged, that heretofore has been invisible, that has falls at the bottom of every metric in California that matters, absolutely has to be recognized. And whether that's in compensation or uh, policy, um, I, we believe that. And, I'm, and Member Grills believes that too. Uh, but I, the reason I say it's sort of secondary because it doesn't matter. The task force has spoken. And every task force member, uh, I think, is duty bound to carry out the will of the task force. That's the purpose of d deliberation. That's the purpose of voting. And once the body decides the direction, that is the direction. So uh, in, in prefacing the public education portion, you know, we have kept that in, that in mind. But, um, uh, you know, th these worries and legitimate concerns are raised at just about every meeting. I just thought it would be helpful to, to let folks know. Um, okay. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, I'm so pleased that uh, Cheryl Grills um, and the task force has voted to, to put her on the uh, Public Education Committee because it, it is a ton of work. And it does require um, the expertise of an educator, a professor, uh, as you will see. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Member Grills to begin the presentation. OK. And so as you see here, the charge of this advisory body is to recommend appropriate ways to educate the California public of the task force's findings and future reparations actions by the state. So Don, do you want to share about the goal? Yeah, I think the goals are, uh, of public education are full, fourfold. Uh, number one, they're required by AB 3121. And uh, the campaign or the, the process would be to meet the following. To get, educate the California public of the task force's findings, the interim report, and the final report when it's issued in June. In a lot of ways, as Senator Bradford and um, Assemblyman Joan Sawyer has pointed out, after June, when we submit the report, that's when the real work begins to reach and penetrate the, the American public and California public. And by the way, 
as I think everybody knows, the, the nation's going to be watching, in, certainly in June and thereafter, what we do here. Secondly, to build a collective base of knowledge to inform racially diverse communities in California uh, of, of the justice and the need for reparations. Yes, this is absolutely a black issue. Yes, the descendant community absolutely uh, is entitled to repairs. But we've also got to persuade the rest of California and the nation of the rightness and justiceness of this cause. So um, that, that is a principal purpose of the public uh, education, to increase their appreciation of why reparations is needed. Three, to expand the discussion of reparations into mainstream conversations, uh, to increase the understanding and support for future uh, legislative action to implement the task force's recommendations. In other words, to move the needle of public opinion to create the political will to get something done after we make our report to the legislature. Four, to inspire in reflection and action among residents of California in support of, I would say, both domestic and international standards of, of reparations, including uh, not only compensation, rehabilitation, restitution, but guarantees of non-repetition, uh, in other words, stopping the harm. Uh, to create basically a new narrative. So this is not a one and done, that uh, we make the recommendations, the legislation, as in other forms of reparations that we've seen, including Japanese American. It's been, here's compensation, here's what we're gonna do, and then it's over. I think everybody here on the task force is committed to putting forth a comprehensive uh, reparations proposals that go on, you know, the, the harm was long in the making and the repairs should also be both immediate and permanent and long in the making. Um, okay. I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so the Public Education Action Plan um, is divided into two parts. The first part is our actions for implementation during the term of the task force. And the second are actions included in the final report as recommendations to the legislature to advance public education. So with respect to action number one, implementing um, actions during the term of the task force, there are several things that we are looking at. First, uh, creating, a power, or creating a PowerPoint, CCG, uh, the Charles Group, has developed a master PowerPoint summarizing the 13 chapters of the interim report for task force members to use, modify, and um, um, apply in their interviews, conversations, et cetera. Secondly, there's messaging. To help the public understand that reparations is a justice and humanitarian issue, the Public Education Advisory Committee will work with uh, the Charles Group to develop slogans, taglines, quotes, metaphors that take complex and contentious subject matter and makes it more, make it more easily understandable um, and where necessary um, respond to shifts and moves and modifications in the narrative about what people think reparations means. It would also include infographics that can simplify a complex, to try to simplify, a complex story of 400 years of oppression and the need to make reparations more easily understandable. Then there's also uh, the point counterpoint messaging. So there are a number of critiques, criticisms, uh, pushback of, against this idea of reparations. So we will be working in collaboration with um, uh, our, two of our um, partners, um, Dr. Darity and Kirsten Mullen, to come up with point counterpoint um, um, commentary. As someone mentioned earlier, you want talking points. We're working on some talking points. We agree that there needs to be clear, cogent uh, rebuttals to attacks against reparations. Cheryl, can I add one thing yeah. to that mm -hmm. point? <clears throat> so I think it um, is important that Professor um, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen uh, have agreed to help us on this. And um, in the seminal book, you know, From Here to Equality, uh, there's a chapter at the end of the book which addresses 
the arguments typically against reparations and also the counterpoint about uh, what the message should go back to. So just to quote um, Prof Professor Darity and Kristen Mullen, uh, one of them, it was, it was so long ago, there is no reason to keep bringing up slavery. Um, I'm sure you've heard that. Um, didn't America already pay its debt for slavery in, in blood by waging the Civil War, which resulted in emancipation? It's really, you know, it is uninformed, it, it is ignorant, but that's uh, what we hear. Quote, blacks already have received reparations in the form of welfare monies and funds from other social service programs. We're, we are getting that and we're going to get that even more as this intensifies. So we're fortunate and grateful to Professors Darity and Kirsten Mullen um, to assist on, on that public education part so we can throw out and get out there the counter narrative. Okay, so the fourth action um, is the development of a curriculum. So the advisory committee is in talks, communication with University of California School of Education professors Travis Bristol and Talani Britton to develop a curriculum based on the interim report. Um, Dr. Travis um, is uh, trained from Columbia University, Stanford University, and Amherst College. He's currently an associate professor of teacher education and education policy at Berkeley School of Education. He's chair of uh, the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards. Um, the list goes on and on in terms of his um, uh, qualifications. Dr. Talani is, uh, uh, Talani Britton is trained at Harvard School of Education, Columbia University and Tufts. Uh, she is known for her research on students' transition from secondary school to higher education and retention and the impact of the war on drug, drugs era mass incarceration on decreases in college enrollment. She's worked as a high school math teacher and college counselor in New York City public schools uh, and comes with extensive skills and capacities. The plan is that the curriculum project will commence before the expiration of the term of the task force, which will continue thereafter through 2023 and into 2024. The fourth action is addressing um, and, and, uh, the racist laws and cases. So there has been a compendium of racist laws and cases that has been developed. The Department of Justice uh, was working with the Loyola Marymount University School of Law, um, uh, Eric Miller, uh, and LMU African American Studies Department Chair, uh, Dr. Marnie Campbell who have compiled this compendia of state and federal laws and cases showing how deeply racism shaped the policies, laws, and judicial outcomes of the nation and California in particular, demonstrating that in fact, all three branches of government, government were willing actors in racial subjugation and exclusion, or they were complicit partners, or in rare, in rare instances to the contrary, were instruments of justice. Uh, <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, we are in coordination with professionals pursuing um, um, public education initiatives that they themselves have generated. So in that regard, um, there is now in production um, a docu-series, a 12-episode docu-series based on 12 chapters of the interim report. This docu-series is being done by professionals in film and television. In particular, Chan Berry, who was one of the directors and producers of Dark Girls and Dark Girls 2, among a, no, a, a number of other uh, productions, and the School of Film and Television um, Associate Dean, um, oh, I'm blocking on his name, Charles Swanson um, at Loyola Marymount University School of Film and Television. The docuseries will consist of 22 to 30 minute, minutes of footage uh, per episode, uh, similar to a typical 30-minute television segment because they will actually be um, taking the docu-series idea to major networks um, to see if uh, one would pick them up. In addition to general community screenings, um, again, it's gonna be pitched not just to major television uh, outlets, but also to um, cable uh, outlets. 
The goal of each episode is to, one, educate the general public about each set of harms and prospective recommendations, and secondly, to generate discussion and public support for African American reparations in California. Um, each interview will include interviews with a number of civil rights and political leaders, community members telling their personal stories, task force members, uh, et cetera. And um, the first episode is actually going to be focusing on the path uh, pathologizing the black family. Okay, uh, Don. Yeah, so this next thing in, in terms of working with outside organizations uh, who are doing this on their own, uh, the, among the first of them was the John M. Langston Bar Association, the Black Bar Association of Lawyers in Los Angeles, and the Japanese American Bar Association that have created a website and are working with other groups and other volunteers to begin to get endorsements of the task force at various levels. And some of the endorsements go to endorsing the task force and or endorsing the interim report or at least endorsing the study of reparations, that it is time. And so <clears throat> scrolled above, you can begin to see the array of organizations that with not a whole lot of effort are throwing their reputations behind this. And um, they didn't need a whole lot of persuasion. You'll note there's a lot of Asian American organizations, Japanese American organizations that support this. Why? Because they know the healing power of reparations. And um, of course, by the time uh, we get into it to, through March and April, I'm hoping that this list will be well beyond the 67 or so that are listed. There, there's actually more now uh, that are pending, it's probably more like 80, and that by June, you know, we'll have hundreds of, of folks. And I think that's in and of itself a new story, that there's a multi-racial group of both big and small organizations representing um, different constituencies that are throwing in on this and, and want to support it. Uh, thanks to Pastor Brown, um, I'll be talking to um, the San Francisco Interfaith Council, which has about, I'd say, 20 uh, churches within it, its membership. And uh, so that's another uh, group in, in, the, in California, Northern California, and hoping to spread uh, into the faith community in Southern California and in the center of the state that will be uh, part of this list. Uh, the Los Angeles Bar Association, lawyers that I'm most connected with, uh, because uh, I am an attorney, uh, is now considering this before the board, as well as the Bar Association of San Francisco. I mention this because these are not fringy groups. I mean, these are not small organizations. These are mainstream organizations that I think have some sense that we need, we need to have something, we need to have a serious movement and uh, result from from this this effort, and that's that's all to the good. Okay. Cheryl. Okay. So now with action um, two, these are actions um, included. Vice Chair Brown had a comment. Is that oh, uh, Vice Chair uh, Brown, you right. Dr. Grill, uh, let me share also <clears throat> with the task force and the audience. The Liz Scrolls, just last week, the San Francisco Democratic Central Committee unanimously voted to support reparations. And in addition to that, it's just a matter of, um, of meeting and getting it done, but we will have the San Francisco Interfaith Council has more than uh, 20 members in that body of all faith persuasions. So every round goes higher and higher. Yep. And all we have to do is just keep pushing and we will find that we will have more converts to come and join this great movement. 
but to have that San Francisco Democratic system committed to unanimously vote to support reparations. That's a big achievement. Thank you. So in terms of action number two, these are actions included in the final report as recommendations to the legislature to advance public education. There are three components to the actions um, in, in this section. First, a curriculum. So it's anticipated that the task force's return, retained experts will continue to work um, on developing the curriculum based on the interim report through 2023 and possibly into 2024. And it's recommended that that curriculum be incorporated into public schools at age appropriate grade levels, but that curriculum could also be used by the general public. Secondly, that hard copies of the interim report be made available to public spaces like libraries, uh, et cetera. And then third, that there be a public education fund established to educate the public about American history as discussed in the interim report. And um, that education fund could pay for um, other kinds of curriculum, audio books, public art displays, literary works, documentary films, student essay contests, seminars, podcasts, uh, and more. So as we wrap it up, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Don. Yeah, so <clears throat> throughout the, and this is a suggestion, uh, for, for task force members to consider. We have 13 chapters in the interim report, and throughout the interim report are various apologies, apologies uh, for, by government for the harms, apologies um, for the passage of the legislation, ap uh, apologies for uh, racist uh, monuments, um, uh, glorifying uh, racial oppression and, and so on. And so um, we kind of thought for public, for the public, for the media, for the ease of uh, getting to it, um, that the apologies sh should be aggregated and, and located in one place instead of sprinkled uh, sort of throughout um, the our proposal. So the recommendation basically is to uh, center the apology in its own chapter that synthesizes all of the apologies mentioned across the other proposals and, and put it all in one section. So certainly that, that's up for discussion. Uh, we thought it would have more impact that way and uh, a reader and the le policymaker media would not have to go searching through, you know, we're now considering 100 pages uh, proposals and to have a, its own standalone chapter on the apology, we thought that would be a good idea. And um, to follow up on, on Pastor Brown's point uh, about um, uh, the governor, of uh, first governor of California, Peter Burnett, um, the apology should also encompass, if, if it's not already, uh, the apologies by specific um, political leaders that really um, set California's complicitness uh, in the harm. And so, uh, but conceptually, from a formatting point, the key is to put it all in its own, own chapter. Uh, so that, again, is a part of informing, shining a light um, uh, to, to uh, give insight to the public how deeply uh, this is embedded in the history of California and in the culture. Thank you. That's our report. Thank you, uh, members Tamaki and members Grills for uh, that amazing presentation. Are there any comments or questions from the task force members um, about what's been presented? Uh, Member Bradford, you're recognized. Thank you, member Tanat, Tamaki and Dr. Grills for that comprehensive report, I really appreciate it. My question really is just for DOJ. How many hard copies have been printed of the interim support so far? Because that's what I constantly being asked in the community, how do we get it? And is it st still available online to look at it? The uh, interim report is available online. Uh, there were 
Uh, I would probably say close to a thousand copies originally printed from the original print date through to the present. We have been fulfilling requests by members of the task force in sending those out. Um, that has been, uh, that's one of the unbudgeted expenses that is a DOJ cost uh, in terms of the printing. Uh, but we, uh, in, in uh, accordance to the direction of the task force, um, have been working with legislative staff to make sure that members of the legislature who would like a copy receive one. Uh, there still are some copies available. Um, and we've tried to make them available at the meetings that we've been having in person as well. Uh, we do recognize that the interim report is about three months away from being complete, and so um, we'll soon need to start printing copies of that final report um, and haven't made any additional re requests for orders uh, for the interim report. Have all 120 members of the legislature already received a hard copy of this report? The uh, a copy was transmitted to the legislature, to the secretary, of this, um, and we have done outreach to the members uh, for uh, distribution for those who would like a copy of the report. I mean, I will take it upon myself to leave it at every office. I just think every member needs to have this before that final report gets out, and so uh, it would be very helpful if all 120 members of the lecture get a copy of this as soon as possible. So we do have the set. What we can do is arrange for 120 to be delivered uh, to one of the legislative members' offices for distribution. Well, we don't need 120 because some of us already have it, but those members that don't have it, whatever that number is, I I'll take it upon myself to make sure it gets to those members. Okay. Oh, I had a suggestion. Um, so will there also be hard copies of the final report to be available or just the interim report? Yeah. yeah, I would imagine that we would, once the final report is done and everything is compiled into one document, that we could make those available, hard copies, definitely to the public libraries and other spaces and places where people frequent to review materials. Uh, member John Sawyer recognized. I just want to make sure we, because uh, as we move forward, we're, we're going to need as many allies as possible. And I, I don't, and I believe there are a lot of people we don't necessarily have to convince, but just make sure they understand what's going on. And I think they will gladly join. Um, Dr. Brown has kind of put the gauntlet down for those of us from LA, since the San Francisco Democratic Party has endorsed, I'm going to make sure I do everything in my power to make sure the Los Angeles County Democratic Party also um, is fully behind us and endorses it. And then with the two, maybe we can get the California Democratic Party then to move forward. And uh, that's a whole process in itself. And uh, as a former secretary of the party, I can make that happen. But I say that to say that the most important next step, which I want to commend um, Don Tamaki and, and Cheryl Grills on, is getting others to sign on and support this. And uh, they put in a lot of hours, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, this is a labor of love for, for, for them. And uh, we have a great start. Um, it's probably the, the one thing that's kind of united all of us yeah. in getting as many people outside of this room and outside of this, this committee um, to join hands with us um, to, to fight for this. Because that is, um, the, you know, all the discussion that's happening now is good, and I'm glad we're ironing everything out. But the, the biggest challenge is uh, getting it through the legislature and then to the governor's good desk, and we need uh, all hands on deck in a unified manner to make that happen. And so while we have 67, 60, with Reverend Brown's 269 and growing, uh, if we have hundreds of organizations, if you know of any, that would like to sign on to this, let us know, because the bigger and faster and larger we make this mass, um, it makes our job um, a lot easier uh, to be able to move this, move this uh, movement, as Dr. Brown always said. We, if we're going to create a movement, this is how you create a movement. And so again, I want to commend you on the Public Education Advisory Committee, because it, it is vital right now to get it done. Thank you.
Uh, Member Holder, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, a question about the the public education with respect to getting the the books, the reports to libraries. I'm wondering whether that's inclusive of libraries in all the UC systems mm -hmm. and the the Cal State, mm -hmm. and whether there's mm -hmm. a, whether there is some whether we have ideas about how to organize specifically college campuses because mm -hmm. if we can get traction with students, uh, they are tremendous catalysts for for mobilizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, we should be including the Cal States and the UCs as um, part of the public system of libraries. Um, but I also like the idea of getting to the private universities as well. And you know, I, I believe we could just kind of send complimentary copies to a list of the California pro uh, private universities across the state uh, as a start to go along with the ones that are gonna be received by the Cal States and UCs. May I add one thing? <clears throat> so the, the website that currently houses the uh, endorsements and lists kind of the level of endorsements and also the endorsement letters. And uh, many, many of the endorsers have chosen to craft their own support letter, you know, reciting the importance of reparations as it relates to their own community or their own profession or their own subject matter expertise. And so those can be found on supportreparations.org. And this is the website set up by, as I said, the John M. Langston Bar Association and Japanese American Bar Association. And on it are like, if, if groups don't want to do their own letter, they could easily um, punch a button and sign on to a template. And it's very easy. Uh, I have to say that as you click on the names uh, in that supportreparations.org, uh, many of them, uh, it, will, it will reveal their own customized letter, which is very interesting, um, and how much thought ha have been put into those letters. But others have simply uh, signed on to a template that's available uh, there. And, and groups can endorse at whatever level they, they feel comfortable with. Um, so, there's that option and that tool available. Thank you. So who is the point of contact to um, update the endorsements list in case there's some organization? That, that would be me, yeah. Uh, I could certainly do that. And I'm in touch with the people that are, literally, they're updating the, uh, the website every day, multiple times a day. And in fact, just got an email adding, you know, uh, four more organizations who are endorsing. They're coming in quickly, which is very gratifying. And the fact that uh, certain groups have taken a position on this is it, it encourages others to to also join. So there's a momentum that is developing. Now, I will say it doesn't have to be the only effort. So there are groups here that are want to do their own endorsement list. Great. You know, I, I think we want to spread this as widely as possible, at least that's my personal opinion. But the ease of this, uh, to use uh, this particular website, it, it's convenient, and there are already great organizations on it. Uh, I had a question about the, the docu-series. Um, so I do have a background in entertainment, entertainment law, so I just wanted some clarification. Member Gross, you said the docu-series is in production, so I just wanted to uh, be clear, because um, when you're talking about the development of film and TV projects, there's development stage, there's production, and then there's post-production. So are you saying that this docu-series has passed the development stage and now it's in the production stage? It's past the development stage, and now it's officially in production. Because if it's in, officially in production, I would like to know, you know, who are the producers, the EPs, who who is attached to the project, and is the ask for us to, um, as a task force, to you know endorse this docu series. My concern is we don't really know who's attached to the project, the producers, the EPs, especially if it's past the development stage. Like, what input? Are you asking from the task force around this docu-series, if any? 
So the, um, this is, these were independent folks, raised their own money, um, and um, have already, um, uh, they have a whole team of producers, writers, uh, the director, uh, et cetera. And for different episodes, that, that cast of, of uh, that team changes. Um, the, this is a gift to the task force. And so the hope is that all task force members will um, make themselves available to be interviewed, um, that task force members who have particular expertise uh, on certain chapters will want to provide their technical input. The anchor organizations are all in, invited to do the same. Um, and we're, yeah, so it's, it's, this is a gift to the task force. So the, the, the goal that they have with the first episode is to have it ready by the time of the release of the final report. And um, if, depending on the day and the location of where that report is released, that there could be a screening on that day, if adding to the publication. I didn't hear it. Thank you. All right. Um, yes. Yes, this is a professional company. And yes. OK, I just wanted some clarifying some clarity on that. I'll just follow up privately um, for more information. OK, that's it for me. Any other comments, questions? One final question, uh, and again, this is to the D, uh, DOJ. Has the governor's office received a hard copy of this? I'm not aware of whether the governor's office has received one. I think we should one. make sure that's top of the list, too, for distribution. Yeah, I think he should be in his office. But do they have a hard copy? Okay. I'm, I'm told they have received the report. Whether it's a hard copy or not, I don't know, but I can confirm that. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Member Montgomery Stepp. Yes, thank you. I just have a, um, a comment, I think, about the recommendation about the apologies. Um, I would agree that, um, that it would be more impactful compiled, um, you know, before going into the policy proposals. Thank um, you. So I just wanted to chime in on that. Do we need a motion on that? So <clears throat> would it be a motion on the entire public education report or just on the formatting of the separate apology into its, its own chapter? Uh, it can be the same, uh, consistent with the comments that have been made. Um, we will, t later this afternoon, be talking about the organization. Um, so it can be our recommend, that is our recommendation that it be consolidated. But right now, if you want to sort of yeah. have, a, have the, outlines and parameters of what you described as an apology, all the apologies for all the different okay, sections. Okay, I get it. So, so, so basically, um, again, thinking out loud with you, uh, the, D D uh, the DOJ, since this is a formatting issue for the final report, uh, the DOJ needs direction on um, uh, putting, putting the apology in one section. So uh, with the chair's permission, I'll make a motion. Okay, I would move that the uh, various apologies that are contained within the proposals be um, aggregated into one separate chapter. And um, as a matter of segueing into that, maybe each of the proposals might have a reference, uh, you know, directing the reader to the chapter on the apology. Uh, as a matter of formatting, but the substance of the apology and the various topics of the apology will all be put into one chapter. Second motion. It is improperly moved by Member Tamaki and properly seconded by Vice Chair Brown that we will aggregate all of the apologies across the different chapters into one uh, chapter for public apologies. Is there any discussion on the matter? No further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Okay, thank you. 
I will begin the roll call with Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer. Aye. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there were nine members present in voting. There were nine ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. Parliamentarian Johnson, nine ayes, zero nays, unless the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Um, any other comments or questions? Chair Moore, just to clarify, we're also, you know, what uh, Member Tamaki was talking about with regard to uh, racist uh, leaders, politicians, past, you know, we'll include that, we'll endeavor to include that, so when you see the draft, um, you'll be able to see what's included and let us know um, if others should be added in or if we should add in any other information. But that'll be consolidated into this chapter by this direction as well. My last comment about the docu-series, since it's past the development phase and it's, it's in production, I understand this is a gift to the task force, but since it's past the development phase, Dr. Grills, Member Tamaki, um, can this, whoever's you know, doing this for the task force, can they present a deck, their deck, uh, to the task force? So we have an understanding about you know, what the docu-series will entail. I think that's like a minimal ask, because again, if it's past the development phase, that's one of the first things you have to have to develop a film or TV project is a deck, like a slideshow of what the project would entail. I can ask them. Thank you so much. Other comments or questions? All right, so thank you so much, Member Tamaki and Member Grills for that comprehensive public education uh, update. And the next item on the agenda is um, number 19, discussion and action item advisory committees, final recommendations. Uh, we are running late, so I'm wondering if we should, if we could just go to lunch, um, reorder the agenda a bit, go to lunch, um, return around 1.20ish, and then resume with the rest of the agenda, agenda item number 19. Sounds good. So we'll return around 1.20ish or so. Thank you.